Hi, I'm Wendy Zuckerman, and you're listening to Gimlet Media's Science Versus. This is the show where we pit facts against foodies. On today's show, science versus organic food. Is it really better for you and for the environment? We're going to start today on Reeves Farm. It's a big family-owned farm in upstate New York. Turn left onto Reeves Road. And they grow a whole lot of fruits and veggies. There's peppers, strawberries, zucchinis, squash, tomatoes. Do you think we'll get to ride in the tractor? <laughs> Very possible. This is it. Excellent. Okay. Ah, a ride in the tractor. It's the small things. So, this farm is run by three brothers, Mark, Andy and Brian. And their family has been cultivating this land for generations. Mark walked me around the farm, showing me the little seedlings on the back of trucks ready to be planted. He told us what it was like back in the day. We had apple trees along where these barns are. That's where we made our tree houses, you know. And uh, now it's all changed. Mark says that one important thing that's changed around his farm is that several years ago, the Reeves family started growing organic food alongside their conventional crops. And Mark says that going organic has meant doing some things a little bit differently. What is the biggest difference between organic and conventional? The pain in the ass. That's the biggest difference. Doing it the hard way. Mark says that going organic is doing it the hard way because he's not allowed to use certain synthetic pesticides and fertilisers to grow his organic crop. That's what makes it organic and not conventional. But Mark says that all this extra effort to produce organic food is worth it. Why? Because the industry is booming. In the US last year, it was estimated that we bought more than $37 billion worth of organic food. What do people tell you about the organic? What do they What do they say? Just feel it feels good, you know. I just feel that it's better for me. And the one that really drives me up the wall is I think it tastes better. When they say that, yeah. they say well, that the organic tastes better. I say, okay, you know, I just okay, whatever, you know. That's what you tell them. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't taste any better. Suffice to say, the Organic Trade Association doesn't use Mark as their spokesperson, but they don't need Mark. Because organic has plenty of advocates. People are going absolutely bonkers for organic. And over and over, surveys are finding that people buy organic food for the same couple of reasons. And those are the things we're going to serve up today. First course, does organic taste better? Second course, is organic more nutritious? Does it have more vitamins in it? Third course, is conventional worse for your health because it has toxic chemicals on it? And for dessert, is organic better for the environment? Now, even our organic farmer, Mark Reeves, finds a lot of this hard to swallow. Do you think people that buy organic food are suckers? Jesus, she's harsh, isn't she? No, they're not suckers. They, uh, they believe different than me, that's all. They got a different uh, point of view. You know, theirs is wrong, but I mean, other than that... So who's right, Mark or his customers? Because when it comes to our food, there's lots of opinions. But then there's science. An important announcement here. Organic food is a big topic. So today we're focusing on fruits and veggies, not meat. And we're saving genetically modified organisms, which aren't allowed in organic food, for their own episode. Let's start with one of Mark's biggest gripes, that people think organic food tastes better than conventional food. Does it? We know what Mark thinks. Okay, whatever. It doesn't taste any better. But hold on there. Mark hasn't done peer-reviewed studies. Lucky for us, researchers at the University of Uppsala in Sweden have. In a series of experiments, they gave people slices of tomatoes, presenting them as organic or conventional. And hey, good news for organic, people were more likely to say that the tomatoes presented as organic were tastier. But oopsala, here's the catch. Some of those tasty, seemingly organic tomatoes were actually conventional. The researchers at Uppsala University purposefully misled people. Other studies have similarly found that slapping an organic label over food, even if it's not organic, 
can make people think it tastes better. Generally speaking, though, research has found that growing a crop organically or conventionally doesn't consistently affect its taste. But Mark did tell us about something that does consistently affect the taste of fruits. Say, strawberries. I take the Nutella. You know Nutella, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, I know Nutella. I cut the stems off, spear it with a fork, shove it down in a Nutella bottle, and swirl it about four times. Conclusion. When you cover something in Nutella, it tastes delicious. Put that hazelnut spread over some pancakes, strawberries. Just, just delightful. But, uh, yeah, when it comes to taste, whether it's conventional or organic, doesn't make a difference. Okay. Another big reason why people buy organic is because they think it's more nutritious. That is, they think it's packed with more vitamins and minerals than the conventional stuff. But is it? Dr. Catherine Bradbury is a nutritional epidemiologist at Oxford University. If you review all of the studies, there's really not a lot of difference between organic and conventionally grown fruit and vegetables. You know, there's no difference in vitamin C content and potassium content and magnesium content overall. Catherine says that while there are many studies looking at whether or not there is more nutrition in organic foods, some studies say yes, others say no, when it comes to science, you have to look at the overall picture. And in 2012, researchers at Stanford did just that. They looked at scores of studies on the nutritional value of organics, analysing vitamin levels in tomatoes, eggplants, carrots, corn, plums, strawberries, peppers, wheat, kale, yes, even kale. And, quote, We did not find significant differences in the vitamin content of organic and conventional. End quote. And any minor differences that were found wouldn't matter for most people. For example, organic produce tended to have more phosphorus in it. But the authors wrote that would only be important to someone facing near total starvation. So... Probably not an issue for most people buying organic. Conclusion. The science is not there to support the claim that organic means it's more nutritious. It's pretty simple. So you can tick that off your list of reasons to buy organic. Next on that list, fear that conventional produce is covered in toxins that are going to make you sick. Perhaps when you think of an organic farm... You think of a serene farm with fruits and vegetables left to grow as nature intended, free from dangerous chemicals. And perhaps you think that because a lot of advertising is telling you that. Like this gem from the advocacy group Only Organic. And some organic farming techniques actually do fit this song and dance. Well, not exactly Uh this song and dance, but the Reeves brothers don't use chemicals in some processes. For example, they say goodbye to weed killer on their organic strawberries. Andy, Reeves brother number two, told me all about it while he was working the strawberry fields. In a tractor. Andy? Hello. Hello. Ready? Ready. You want to head on? Yeah, that'd be great. Without weed killer on their strawberries, the Reeves brothers use a real old school approach. We probably will hand weed the organic strawberries ten times a season. And, uh, hand weed. Hand weed ten times a season. Uh, do you do the hand weeding personally? Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> Did you ever? I'm 63 years old. It's hard for me to even say the word. (laughs) The Reeves Farm doesn't hand weed because they think it's the right thing to do. Organic food regulations actually don't allow farmers to use the potent weed killers that they can on their conventional strawberries. But that doesn't mean the Reeves organic crops are chemical free. Organic certification does allow farmers to use some synthetic chemicals to kill pests. Because while you can hand weed, you can't hand pick out fungi and bacteria from a crop. So even organic crops sometimes need chemicals. Here's Mark, brother number one. So what is this? 
says fungicide, bactericide. This is, this is uh, copper hydroxide. Copper hydroxide. This is organic? Yes, it is. Mark handed me a heavy paper bag. Like a lot of pesticides, it had the word danger written across it. Peligro. Keep out of reach of children. It's going to stick my hand in it. It's like really fine powder. And it's kind of aqua marini. Uh, and now my hands are a bit blue. Copper oxide is, uh, if you take a copper pipe and it gets corroded, it turns blue like that. When you're spraying uh, that copper there, you want to really want to coat every leaf on, on the plant everywhere if you can. You want that, that coating all over the plant if you can. And that coating, whether it comes from an organic or a conventional pesticide, can remain on the food you take home from the store, even sometimes after you wash it, in very, very small amounts. But the important question for us is this. Are the tiny traces of pesticides sometimes found on organic food safer than those on conventional foods? The best study we have on this comes from Catherine Bradbury, you heard from her before, and her colleagues at the University of Oxford. So Catherine followed more than 620,000 women, some who ate organic food, others who ate conventional food, for nine years. She was looking for which women developed cancers. Here's Catherine. So we wanted to look at uh, whether people who ate organic food were less likely to get cancer because that's one of the big beliefs out there. And Catherine found that women who said they usually or always ate organic food were less likely to get non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's good news for organic. But here's the catch. The study also found that those who said they ate organic food a lot were more likely to get breast cancer compared to those who said they never ate organic food at all. So, less likely to get one type of cancer, more likely to get another type of cancer? What do we do with that? Well, Catherine says these specific correlations could just be chance findings, statistical blips that have nothing to do with diet. Because, you see, Catherine also looked at the overall cancer rate. And... It would have been amazing if you saw that, you know, they had a 50% reduced risk of getting cancer overall. And then we saw the overall result and said, OK, yeah, <laughs> there's nothing there. That's right. There was no overall difference in the cancer rate between women who ate organic and those who didn't. But Catherine wants more research because even though her study was big and comprehensive, it was still inconclusive. And Catherine's study, published in 2014 is the largest and longest of its kind. We have no other long-term research comparing the health of a lot of people who eat organic versus conventional. And that means we can't say more about whether or not eating small amounts of pesticides on your food might cause other diseases. Now, there have been studies looking into people who are exposed to high doses of conventional pesticides, like agricultural workers. So, for example, there is some research suggesting that agricultural workers have a high risk of certain kinds of cancers, like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and breast cancer. There is also some preliminary work into pregnant women living in agricultural communities and the effect of pesticides on their unborn children. But... These studies can't be clearly translated to the average Joe at the supermarket because that average Joe is eating a steady diet of foods with tiny traces of pesticides but is never exposed to large amounts of them. Cynthia Curl is an assistant professor in environmental health at Boise State University in Idaho and she says that when it comes to pesticides... We know that in high enough doses they're toxic, otherwise they would be pretty poor pesticides, we really don't know at these low levels whether there are health effects. So if you're down to the levels that we're talking about in conventional food, is it below a threshold where there would be anything to worry about? That's the million dollar question. With all this uncertainty, it's understandable why people are clamoring to get Cynthia to give speeches. Oh, yeah, I've had friends ask me to, you know, come talk to their preschools about the dangers of pesticides. Oh. I really try not to get into that. <laughs> what would you tell a preschooler? <laughs> to eat their fruits and vegetables. That's what I would tell them. Yeah. I mean, we, we really have a hard time saying, even from, even from very well-studied single pesticides, what level is safe, what level is unsafe, what do we mean by that? 
the the unknowns on this topic just really outweigh what we know. I know that's probably not helpful for your podcast, but here's something you should know. When a pesticide scientist goes to the supermarket, does she buy organic? <laughs> Uh, you know, I have a one-year-old and I do because I can. Um, I recognize that it's a luxury. But you did say it because you've got a one-year-old. So there's like a, I guess there, it's just a risk-benefit analysis and you're like, we don't know, but. Yeah, pretty much. Cynthia told us that she also buys organic food for other reasons, like the potential health risks to agricultural workers. Conclusion. When it comes to understanding how traces of pesticides on our food affects our overall health, we don't know much. But the one big study we do have is on cancer. And overall, it found no link between eating conventional food and getting cancer. And there is no other strong evidence that buying organic is in any other way better for your health than conventional produce. So that's health. But what about the environment? A quick break, and when we get back, we're looking at the bigger picture. Is organic farming better for our planet? This episode is brought to you by Capital One. With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than deciding to listen to another episode of your favorite podcast. And with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? Get started today. It only takes about five minutes to open an account with Capital One, and there's no minimum to open and keep your account. That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank. Capital One NA, member FDIC. If it seems like there are a lot of people quitting their jobs right now, it's because they are. We're working so hard that we forgot to think about what makes us happy. I would just sit at my desk and cry. I just got to the point where I had to say, I don't know if I can do this. And it's not just quitting. There's a lot of unusual things happening in the economy. Car shortages, soaring lumber prices, inflation. We cover all this and more on The Journal Podcast, out every weekday afternoon. Tap now to listen to The Journal on Spotify. Choose your own offline listening adventure. Spotify Premium lets you download and take your music on the go. Try three free months of Premium now and cancel anytime. Tap the banner to learn more. I'm Yasi Salik, and I'm the host of Band Splain a show where we explain cult bands and iconic artists by going deep into their histories and discographies. We're back with a brand new season at our brand new home, the Ringer Podcast Network, tackling a whole new batch of artists, from grunge gods to power pop pioneers to new metal legends and many, many more. Listen to new episodes every Thursday, only on Spotify. And welcome back to Science Versus. So it's time to talk about the planet. Go planet! Studies find that one of the big motivations for going organic is reducing our impact on the environment. And according to my organic coconut water bottle, organic farming methods means, quote, a better environment for the plants and a cleaner planet for all of us. End quote. But has my coconut water bottle... Just gone coconuts. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. Da, 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 da. When we talk about the environment, there are three main things to consider. One, soil health. Two, chemical contamination. And three, land use. Let's start with soil health. In the first half of the show, we covered some of the things you're not allowed to use on an organic farm. Certain pesticides. But you also have to do certain things to get organic certification. These are generally designed to keep the land, and particularly the soil, healthy. One example is that organic farmers have to rotate their crops. That is, you change where you grow plants each season. And when you do that, it means that the soil doesn't get sapped of the same set of nutrients year after year. Organic farmers also use manure instead of synthetic fertilisers. All for soil health. And research shows that these organic practices work. They trigger processes in the soil that make it more nutrient-rich and thrive with good bacteria, fungi and worms. 
and this can make some plants more resistant to pests and diseases. The healthy soil and diverse crop also bring more birds and insects to the yard. And the organic farmers are like, it's better than yours. Damn right, it's better than yours. Now they can teach you, but they have to charge. <laughs> One review of 94 studies found that organic farms had on average 30% more biodiversity than conventional farms. Conclusion. Organic farming practices tend to create healthy soil and biodiverse farms. All good for the environment. But we're about to throw some manure at organic's green image. Next question. Does organic food prevent chemicals contaminating the environment? Conventional farmers often add synthetic fertilisers to help plants grow. And what makes fertilisers work and the plants grow big is this thing called nitrogen. Now, the problem is that when you pour nitrogen on the plants and they don't suck it up, the excess can run off into lakes, rivers and even the ocean. It can choke off the water's oxygen supply and eventually kill plants and animals. An extreme example of this can be found in the Gulf of Mexico, where nitrogen runoff from farms has drained into the Gulf, creating a 6,500 square mile dead zone. On the pristine beaches of Mississippi, thousands of dead fish, stingrays, crabs and shrimp have washed ashore this month. They died from a lack of oxygen in the coastal waters of the Gulf of Mexico. To avoid things like this, organic farming rules don't allow the use of synthetic, highly concentrated nitrogen. But organic farmers still need a fertilizer because plants, organic or conventional, need a boost to get to market. Mark showed me a bag of the organically approved fertilizer, jam-packed with nitrogen. Look at this. Worm power, the engine of nature. And this derives from earthworm castings. What's that? Come on, you know English, don't you? What is, what, is a, what is an earthworm cast off? I had no idea. We stood there for what felt like a very long time. Shell. That's right. It's shell. No, it's sh Oh, it's shell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's such a lovely <laughs> euphemism. As well as using worm poo or castings for nitrogen, farmers use cow manure. Or at the Reeves property, there's a nearby turkey farm. So we got access to turkey manure. Are they organic turkeys? No, but <laughs> manure, I guess, <laughs> qualifies. Even... Even though the poop didn't come out of an organic crop, I guess. Like nobody's, <laughs> no, if it doesn't seem to have a problem with that. Gimlet producer Lynn Levy, who joined me at the farm, was pretty philosophical about this point. Organic sh but not an organic asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. you got to draw your line where yeah. you draw your line. And that's, that's it. That's the show. asshole. But here's the thing. It may be organic, but that turkey poo and worm casting, it's still full of nitrogen. And if you think it's special just because it's organically approved... You are drawing a line at the asshole, Because that nitrogen, just like the synthetic stuff, it can wash into rivers and lakes. If we put 10 tons of manure on and we only need five, you're going to get some waste that's going to run off. That's all there is to it. Eventually, the uh, water is going to take it away if you don't use it. So yes, organic farming can leach nitrogen into the environment. So then the next question, if you're worried about the environment, is this. Which type of farming leaches more, conventional or organic? Navin Ramankuti is a professor in global food security at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Yeah, a few studies that have been done off leaching seem to show that organic actually leaches more. Leaches more. Yeah, and so that's saying something. When you compare conventional and organic produce, say carrot for carrot, one review of 10 papers focusing on farming in Europe found that there was more nitrogen leaching from organic farms versus conventional. Navin pointed out that this is an average, and there is a lot of variation in how different farms use nitrogen. Organic has the potential to leach more, partly because with manure, unlike precise lab-made fertilisers, it's difficult to give plants just the right amount of nitrogen that they need, potentially leaving more in the ground and more to leach. And that's because nitrogen in poo binds tightly to the soil, and only releases slowly over time. So unlike with lab-made fertilizers, it's harder to give your crops a big jolt that you know they'll absorb. 
Instead, you just have to put a lot of manure on the soil and hope the plants take in as much nitrogen as possible. I'm not saying that we do it right all the time, but it's easier to do in conventional agriculture because you can apply it uh, just when the plants need them and they're much more available to plants, the chemical fertilizers, and so plants can take them up. Conclusion. Even if you're using an organically approved fertilizer, nitrogen runoff can still be a problem. And there's one more environmental question related to organic farming that we have to talk about. Yield. That is, how much organic food can we actually grow and how much space will it take? A review paper published by Navin found that on average, acre for acre, organic farms produce around 25% less food than conventional farms. 25%. And that's because organic farmers can't use the most effective fertilisers, which can mean fewer crops for them and less food for us. So if we want to grow the same amount of food that we do now and we want to do it organically, we will need a lot more space. And we're already using a lot of our best agricultural land. So where would this new organic land come from? Forests? Native habitats? Land set aside for conservation? Your house? And organic farming suffers from another potential yield problem. Because while some organic practices help plants resist disease... If you can't use the most powerful pesticides to kill some particularly nasty pests, it can wipe out a farmer's crop. Here's the third Reeves brother, Brian. Every year I put something organic in the ground, it's riskier than what I put in the ground conventionally. And sooner or later, that risk comes back to bite you. If you had five years of great conventional crops, but you had four years of organic and one year of a disaster, well, you've got to be... You gotta be watch out for that. His older brother Mark agreed, telling me about a feisty beetle battle with his organic acorn squash, where the organic pesticides just didn't work. And I couldn't kill it. I tried like three different organic sprays, and they wouldn't touch. It was a beetle, and they wouldn't touch that thing. Do you remember um, waking up in the morning after you tried one chemical and still seeing that friggin' beetle there? Oh yeah. You know, if you see an insect, it's kind of drunken looking then you know well, he might die it did something though not these guys they were fine i think they liked it <laughs> <laughs> i think they liked it you know more squash for the beetles means less squash for us now this yield problem isn't black and white so there is some scientific debate here and some academics say that we would be fine producing 25 percent less food if we redesign the food system to make sure that we wasted less food. Also, important to note, around a third of our croplands are used to feed livestock. So they feed cows and then we eat the cows. And given this, a paper published this year calculated that if the whole world went vegetarian or vegan, we could shift to an entirely organic system without encroaching into new space. Conclusion. Organic farming has, on average, lower yields than conventional farming. And unless we're planning on living in a tofurky alternate reality, that could be a problem as the population grows. Also, not so fun fact here. At 2050, the population is expected to hit 9 billion. And food production, it's predicted, will need to rise by 70%. And organic food alone probably just can't get us there. So when it comes to science versus organic food, does it stack up? When it comes to taste, science says no. Organic food doesn't taste any better than the conventionally grown stuff. And nutrition, science says no. Overall, organic food isn't more nutritious than conventional food. When it comes to the risks from chemicals on our food, well, there's no conclusive evidence that organic food is safer than conventional food, but there is so little research directly on this that maybe it's just too early to tell. And then there is the effect on the environment. Some organic practices like rotating crops and planting cover crops are really good for the soil and increase biodiversity on the farm. But restricting the use of synthetic fertilizers means organic farming can leach more nitrogen into the environment. Plus, you need more land to grow organic produce. So things are looking pretty even for organic versus conventional. But here's something. 
to blow your mind. Too strong? Nah. Now, while supermarkets and some podcasts pit organic against conventional farming, in reality, it's often not like that. Take the Reeves farm. Mark Reeves may laugh at his organic customers. Okay, whatever. But that's because on his farm, he and his brothers use a lot of organic practices on their organic and conventional crops. The Reeves brothers rotate their crop and don't use too much pesticide on any of their produce, conventional and organic, even though there are no rules telling them that they have to do that on their conventional crops. Plus, a recent study showed that the Reeves farm isn't exceptional. It is actually common for conventional farmers to adopt some organic practices. So why do the Reeves brothers go through all that trouble? We just know we get a heck of a crop. And in the long term, the soil on their farm is healthier. And it's because Mark does some of this organic stuff on his conventional crops that he doesn't totally get this allegiance that people have to organic. I don't believe in it uh, I, because I see what goes on with conventional. On this farm, what happens here, we use so few chemicals here. But as a shopper, it's really hard to know what kind of farm your produce is coming from. So it is understandable why people go for the food with some kind of seal of approval. Still, though, this kind of blended style of farming that Mark is doing, that's exactly what Navin Ramankuti and lots of other scientists think is the future. Using organic practices when they work, but synthetic chemicals when necessary. I think of a farm where... You know, we make use of compost and we make use of manure if we have it. Uh, but I will not shy from using a tiny amount of pesticide or a tiny amount of uh, fertilizer when I need to. And Navin calls this a common sense farm. Not traditionally conventional, not strictly organic, but just good science. That's science versus organic food. Next week is science versus the G-spot. Does it exist? So when you say you examined 400 women, what did you do? Um, can I have your, your vagina for a minute? And stick around for the ultimate orgasmic test. Organic test. It's about organic food. Jeez. This episode has been produced by Heather Rogers, Lynn Levy, Caitlin Kenny, Austin Mitchell and Caitlin Sorry. Edited by Annie Rose Strasser and Alex Bloomberg. Fact-checking by Michelle Harris. Production assistance by Diane Wu and Shruti Ravindran. An extra big thanks to Stevie Lane, Joseph Lavelle Wilson and the Zuckerman family. Thank you for all your help. Sound design and music production by Matthew Boll, mixed by Martin Peralta and Hayley Shaw. Music written by Bobby Lord. Science Versus is a production of Gimlet Media. So, as a little treat for you all, we happened upon some organic cookies. They are for dogs. Yes, dogs. Organic dog cookies. Our co-worker, PJ, works on the podcast, Reply All. He has a new dog. Can you describe what your dog looks like? Uh, my dog looks like a Build-A-Bear or an animatronic Disney teddy bear. So we did a taste test. This is not science, by the way. It's just one dog and two cookies, conventional and organic. I'm gonna throw him over there. Okay, Ralphie, ready? You're gonna get thrown, and then you're gonna get cookies. Ready, go. What's he going for first? What's he going for? He smells oh, organic. 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 <laughs> one for organic. One for organic. Well, that undermined the whole show. I'm Wendy Zuckerman. Back to you next time. Hi, I'm Wendy Zuckerman and you're listening to Gimlet Media's Science Versus. This is the show where we pit facts against foreplay. On today's show, Science Versus the G-Spot. Does it exist? Now before we get started, we are going to be talking really openly about female genital anatomy. Parents, if this will open up a conversation that you're not ready to have right now, you've been warned. And if you're someone who's taking your time with sex, or maybe you're not that excited about it right now, maybe it's just a big, scary thing, we just wanted to say that that's absolutely fine. There is a lot of pressure out there to enjoy sex and want it all the time. 
don't worry about that. Just enjoy the episode, learn things, and ladies, always have sex on your own terms. Okay, now on with the show. Picture it, 1981. Roger Moore was still James Bond. Sandra Day O'Connor was to become the first woman appointed to the US Supreme Court. And the Phil Donahue Show was broadcasting to the nation for its 11th year running. Today on that show, something that would change the way we talk about vaginas for decades to come. What we're about to discuss has to do with uh, sexuality and it has to do with women and it has to do with orgasm. A nurse named Beverly Whipple was about to bravely tell the nation of something exciting inside the vagina. It was a spot that, if pressed, would give you an orgasm. If you stimulate this area, what happens, the orgasm occurs very rapidly, usually within a minute. And people often report that they have many orgasms frequently. Many orgasms frequently. Beverly called the magic button the G-spot, and to find it, she said that someone could insert their finger into your vagina, touching the front wall. But, she told Phil Donahue and the rest of the United States... The best position is the female on top, where the angle of the penis will hit right into the anterior wall. Missionary position just doesn't do it. Now, while Phil Donahue had a few stumbling moments... Okay, now where do we go from here? Um... <laughs> the audience... <laughs> was excited. I want to say I'm thrilled to think I'm here. Did you ever think the television would get to this place? No, I didn't. If my mother was alive, she'd drop dead. Yeah. <laughs> Beverly Whipple and her talk of the G-spot were immediately shot into the limelight. Later, Cosmopolitan magazine would call Beverly one of ten sexual revolutionaries that you should know. She was right up there with Alfred Charles Kinsey and Sigmund Freud. A lot of fanfare and a stamp of approval from Cosmo. But since that interview, many people have hunted for the G-spot in their bedrooms and in laboratories. And enough of them came up empty-handed that it raised the question, does the G-spot even exist? When it comes to sex, there's lots of opinions. But then there's science. It's pretty astonishing that in 2016 there's a debate about whether an anatomical feature, any anatomical feature, exists. And yet, here we are. So today on this show, we're going to approach this topic in a very different way to what we usually do, by telling <coughs> you the story of the G-spot through two scientists who have spent their careers trying to get people to pay attention to the vagina and the anatomy around it. Let's start with the woman from The Phil Donoghue Show, Beverly Whipple. Producer Heather Rogers and I recently drove out to Beverly's house in New Jersey. These days, she's an emeritus professor Jersey. of nursing at Rutgers. And she lives in a gated community. There's cookie-cutter houses and bright white fences. This is, this is not the neighbourhood that I would have expected the G-spot to be born in. <laughs> No, this is where I would expect June Cleaver to live. <laughs> we were pretty giggly. Hello. Come in, come in. Thank you so much. Beverly's sitting room is filled with family photos and books about sex. Multiple orgasmic couple, multiple orgasmic man, any man can. Oh, I don't know. Sexual fitness. Next to... Uh, the only retirement guide you'll ever need. <laughs> so how did this woman, living in a gated community amongst bright white fences, end up on daytime television recommending sexual positions? She told us her path to G-spot fame started in the 1970s. Beverly was teaching nursing when a student asked her, what can a patient do sexually after having a heart attack? The answer wasn't part of the nursing curriculum, but Beverly thought it should be. She wanted to add it to her course. We really did a real good job and we were all excited. But to get it added into the nursing curriculum, it had to go through the college's board of trustees. And uh, they told us we couldn't implement it because we'd be talking about, now listen to my word, masturbation and all those awful things. They couldn't even say masturbation correctly. <laughs> 
Mastribution. Mastribution. <laughs> Beverly was proud of what she'd done, and when the board said no, she realised something, that she didn't want to work for someone who couldn't pronounce mastribution properly. So she quit. Her next job would introduce her to a group of patients who were suffering from their own kind of anxiety about sex. Women who peed when they were orgasming. And these women were very bothered by it. They stopped having orgasm because this occurred with orgasm. And they wanted to make sure that um, they wouldn't have this. They, they thought they weren't normal and they were embarrassed. That's right. That's right. They were very embarrassed. Some women talked about taking towels to bed with them and all these different things. But something else was unusual about these women. You see, Beverly had been taught that women who couldn't control their bladders properly were supposed to have weak pelvic floor muscles. And these women who were peeing during sex had strong pelvic floor muscles. Beverly was floored and she figured something was up. So she started studying these women, looking for why they might be peeing during sex. And while she was looking, she found something else something she wasn't expecting. So we had a nurse practitioner, myself who was a nurse practitioner or a physician, examined 400 women and we found this sensitive area in all of the women. So when you say you examined 400 women, what did you do? Um, can I have your, your vagina for a minute? <laughs> all in the service of journalism. No. Beverly took our producer Heather's hand for a moment and she curved Heather's fingers and palm into a cylinder to look like a vagina, kind of. You put your fingers into the vagina uh -huh. and you push up with quite a bit of pressure. I think you've described it as a come here motion with your hand. With your fingers you use a come here motion. You go all around the vaginal wall, uh -huh. going around the vagina looking for areas of sensitivity from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, et cetera, saying, how does this feel? How does this feel? And between 11 and 1 o'clock, we got a lot of smiles. Well, that feels good. Beverly says that when her team pressed that spot in the vagina of these women, it swelled. And the women, they liked it. Well, what was it like to see the smile on women's faces? And no one... It was wonderful. But we didn't know what was happening yet. Beverly scoured the literature, searching for another scientist who had spotted a similar spot. And she found one article that described what she'd seen. It was published in this pretty obscure journal in 1950 by a Dr. Ernst Grafenberg, who, side note, was the inventor of the world's first IUD, the Grafenberg ring. In his paper, Ernst wrote that by his, quote, own experience of numerous women, end quote, he could always find an erotic zone on the front or anterior wall of the vagina, along the urethra. That's where you pee out of. He wrote that when pressed, this zone would give women an orgasm. He also wrote that occasionally during their orgasms, these women would produce a fluid that is, quote, so profuse that a large towel has to be spread under the woman to prevent the bed sheets getting soiled, end quote. His research matched exactly what Beverly had seen. The spot was in the same place, there was fluid produced, and so much fluid that women were bringing towels to bed, just like Beverly's patients. She wrote up the research and presented this discovery at a meeting with her colleague, John Perry. At the presentation, there was, understandably, some excitement in the room. A colleague came up to her with an intriguing suggestion. He said, you should, Bev, you should call that the Whipple Tickle, which is immediately when I said to John, we're going to name this something. Get it? Beverly Whipple, the Whipple Tickle, because it's her last name, and you tickle the spot, and then boom, orgasms. Sadly, she didn't go with it, because, historical side note, at the time there was a really popular ad for toilet paper from the Shaman Company, and the main character in the ad was a hapless man called Mr. Whipple who just couldn't stop squeezing the Charmin toilet paper. Mr. Whipple, please don't squeeze the Charmin. You're probably too, too young to remember that. But, but our, our son would hear that all the time. Hey, Mr. Whipple, don't squeeze the Charmin. And that's all I could, could, that's all I could think of was. So we immediately uh, called it uh, the Grafenberg spot after Dr. Ernst Grafenberg. It soon got shortened to the G-spot, 
Part of the work was published in the Journal of Sex Research, and from there it was picked up by the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Chicago Tribune, Playgirl, Forum, and that's how Beverly ended up on the Phil Donahue Show. A year later, she published her first book called The G-Spot and Other Discoveries of Human Sexuality. And from there, she was invited by television network after television network to tell the world about the G-Spot. The book says there is a spot inside a woman that when it is stimulated sexually, gives a woman tremendous pleasure. Today, we'll find out more about it. Won't you please welcome one of the authors of The G-Spot, Beverly Whipple. She was introduced to famous people at a conference. She said she rubbed shoulders with President Gerald Ford and his wife, Betty. After the conference was over, uh -huh. I'm walking down the beach in Maui in a bathing suit. And all of a sudden, somebody goes, Beverly, Beverly, can you come here? It was Betty Ford. She wanted to talk to me. What did she want to talk to you about? Anyway, it's, what just, did she say? <laughs> it's just interesting to me. You brought to it me. up. You brought uh, it up. Yeah, but I don't have to say. I just said she knew me <laughs> in a bathing suit. She knew my name was Beverly, and she called. Me. <laughs> so, was she particularly interested in your work? Uh, she was interested in a lot of my work, yeah. She says thousands of women wrote to her, grateful for the work that she was doing. People saying, thank you, you're helping me to feel normal. How did it feel to get those letters? It was wonderful. It was so affirming. It just felt great. But with the growing fame came some controversy. Some people didn't want female orgasms discussed so out in the open. Why do we need this? Why do we need to know there's a G-spot? Your dirty-minded little people working in a back room someplace with weird the fucking women. fucking heathens. Enough already. I mean, enough talk about what should be a very private, personal matter. The backlash she saw, though, was pretty standard fare for the time. Women's sexuality was, and still is, a sensitive subject for mainstream America. But amid all the fame and controversy, a scientific question lingered. What exactly is the G-spot? Is it a bundle of nerves, an organ, a gland, something else? Because even Beverly, the G-spot's biggest cheerleader, didn't know. In her appearance on Donahue in 1981, Beverly had a 3D model of the vagina with all the structures around it, all in anatomical detail. Uh, I brought a model here. It's located but the actual G-spot was literally just a green dot stuck on her model. It might as well have been a question mark. What did you, what did you think was there? I didn't know. I didn't know. That spot that Beverly had found to reliably and regularly produce orgasms... She had no idea why it worked or what it even was. But once she announced it, people all around the world were looking for it. First in private, and then in public. Universities. After the break, we're going on the hunt for the G-spot. This episode is brought to you by Capital One. With no fees or minimums, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than deciding to listen to another episode of your favorite podcast. And with no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank. Capital One NA, member FDIC. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. When you need to hire fast, use Indeed. They're the hiring platform where you can do it all. And they have powerful hiring tools that can help you find top talent quickly, like Indeed Matching. As soon as you sponsor a job post, it'll match you up with qualified candidates that you can invite to apply. So start hiring at warp speed and join the millions already using Indeed. To start hiring out, visit Indeed.com slash science. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Hey, it's Bill Simmons from The Ringer, and this is a podcast called The Rewatchables. We have been doing it really since 2017. It started with how much we love the movie Heat. We decided to structure a whole podcast with categories, most rewatchable scene, who won the movie, Apex Mountain, what age the best. But here's the thing. If you want the full archive, you can hear them only on Spotify. For free, by the way. So make sure to follow The Rewatchables on Spotify. Welcome back. So, Beverly Whipple has just unleashed the G-spot on the world. 
inspiring untold numbers of books, magazine articles, blogs, vlogs, all telling you how to find your G-spot. How do you hit a girl's G-spot? Magic. In practice. You gotta find it. You gotta find it. You gotta work for it. Every woman has a G-spot. Every woman does. God bless them. Even today, people have this sense that the G-spot is a magic orgasm button. Sort of like another clitoris, but on the inside of the vagina. And all sorts of people are poking around looking for it. Including our second scientist. Helen O'Connell is a professor of urology at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Testing, testing. Do you want to tell me what you had for breakfast? Some really exciting kiwi fruit, Wendy. Helen is an important part of this story, but she didn't start out looking for the G-spot. Around the time that all the news about the G-spot was breaking, Helen was a medical student on the other side of the world, in Australia, and she was studying anatomy. And, like Beverly, she was frustrated that there wasn't good information out there about the female body. And Helen saw the problem really clearly every time she looked at her anatomy textbook. We had to use this book called Last Anatomy. It did actually completely omit anatomy of the clitoris. So as a young woman... Would you say completely like there was just like a blank spot? Pretty much a blank spot. For four years running, she was using the same anatomy textbook. I had to immerse myself in this hideous book. And so I'm a little bit probably even angry that it's so bad. (laughs) And then a colleague of Helen's gave her a very different kind of book about women's bodies. She said, you won't believe this book I've got. Oh, oh, what is it? Anyway, she said this bunch of feminists had created this set of diagrams and descriptions called A New View of a Woman's Body. The book was filled with drawings of the female body. It showed fingers pulling back the lips of the vagina to reveal details that Helen hadn't seen in her anatomy textbook. The women had made these drawings by observing each other, sometimes during sexual arousal. But they wrote in their book that they didn't have access to dissection rooms, so they had no way to dissect cadavers and see what the vagina and clitoris looked like from the inside. They did acknowledge that they didn't have access to that and that that would have been preferable. So I remember tucking away at that age, wow, that's something we could do. After all, Helen was in medical school. She had access to cadavers. And so, once she finished her training as a urologist, Helen convinced her university to let her use their cadavers so that she could finish the work that the feminist collective had started and dissect the clitoris once and for all. This was the final frontier. So, Helen put on her gloves and went to work. And then I could see what the anatomy of the clitoris was like and thought, wow. What Helen found is probably not what comes to mind when you think of the clitoris. That bit that you see is only a small part of this organ. It's literally the clit of the iceberg. What Helen found was a large, complicated organ with two arms that extend down, they're called the bulbs, and two legs that go back for up to nine centimetres. That's three and a half inches. And they're called the crura. You want to see a photograph? I I do want to see a photograph. It is a hell of a photograph. So this is a fresh cadaver. Um, So look at the amazing colour. Isn't that incredible? This sort of blue purple. You know, you could imagine that when aroused, that they would really engorge. It is a huge structure. It's pretty big. Yeah. The shape of the entire super clitoris is actually quite hard to describe. Helen gave it a go. So there's there's um, kind of long, uh, you know, that's a sort of wishbone shape, the crura coming forward and meeting. Okay, okay, let me have a crack. All right, so... You're lying on your back, so imagine that the opening of the vagina is a mouth, kind of like a pursed little mouth. Okay, flanked around that mouth is a thick moustache, like a Burt Reynolds moustache, you know, handlebars. So that's (laughs) the bulbs. 
And then draped along the top of the handlebar moustache is this longer, kind of like a ninja moustache. Yeah, so those are the Krura. Right. Two moustaches on top of each other. Vagina is the mouth. Excellent. So now we know what the clitoris looks like. Ugh, anatomy is hard to describe on the radio. We'll put a picture up on our website. Bottom line, the clitoris is big and much more complex than most people, even researchers and doctors, had thought. And once Helen saw the clitoris and all its various parts up close, her personal experience and scientific understanding at last came together. To her, the idea that all the amazing sensations that you can get during an orgasm could come anatomically from a little spot just seemed wrong. If all you see is that external view, so all you see is kind of the tip of the clitoris, but you know from the inside that there's much more happening in your experience. You know, the the pleasurable feelings come from more than the, the glands. It was taking the focus from a kind of illogical place to a more logical place. So it sort of married with people's experience much more. Helen published her detailed descriptions of the clitoris in 1998. And at the time, oh boy, did it get people's attention. Both in Australia. What's the difference between a clitoris and a pub? Well, the answer is an Australian bloke can always find the pub. Dr. Helen O'Connell is a urological... And around the world. Headlines on Helen's seminal work on the clitoris included The Per Factor, Sexist Science Misses a Mountain, and the very classy men's health magazine went with Guess What She Has. But guess what she didn't have? There was something that Helen didn't find. The G-spot. As part of researching the anatomy of the clitoris, I had a good opportunity to look at vaginal anatomy and our studies, these early studies particularly, did not seem to show anything in the vaginal wall that would be a direct anatomical structure leading to that experience. So nothing special in the vagina where the G-spot should be. And Helen, she should know. She's looked at a lot of vaginas in her time. But how many cadavers, how many vaginas do you think you've looked at in a cadaver in your career?
All right, I'm back. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, had to take an important phone call. I think we're probably, in terms of these dissections, probably getting close to 50. So that's not that many, right? Yeah, that's, I would have thought that's a reasonably big experience. <laughs> <laughs> No disrespect, of course. <laughs> Do you know, you're not impressed. <laughs> There's years of work in that, Wendy. <laughs> so, 50 dead vaginas. No G-spot. But Helen has also looked at alive vaginas too. Vaginas that have been scanned with an MRI. And it's this work in particular that makes Helen very sceptical of a G-spot inside the wall of the vagina. Helen says that if you were looking for something that could give you an orgasm, a good candidate would be an area with a lot of blood vessels, something that would swell. It's not known exactly why that is, but swelling might help to activate nerve endings, making an area more sensitive. What we do know is that for both men and women, a sure sign of sexual arousal is increased blood flow to the genitals. And you can see this on an MRI. You can set up the scanner so that white on an area means lots of blood vessels and black means not a lot of blood vessels. The clitoris would become white. That's got a lot of blood flow. So where the G spot is, doesn't have the look of it of that really um, sort of uniformly white structure. Now, if there was a G-spot or a second hidden clitoris on the inside of the vagina, you'd expect it to show up as white too. But it didn't. In one paper, Helen wrote that the clitoris looked white compared to the urethra and vagina, which looked like a, quote, shade of grey, end quote. Yes, very good. Enter a shade of grey joke. Any shade of grey joke will do. Other scientists looking for the G-spot weren't having much luck. One review of a bunch of studies on the G-spot published in 2001 called it, quote, a sort of gynecological UFO, much searched for, much discussed, but unverified by objective means, end quote. A decade later, another review of the work looking at dozens of trials concluded that the studies, quote, still fail to provide irrefutable evidence for the G-spot's existence, end quote. And when we take a close look at Beverly's original research, it's very far from irrefutable. In fact, it's somewhat contradictory. One of her first studies into this, published in 1981, was on just one woman. A second study of 47 women found that they all had this sensitive spot, but pressing it in the lab did not produce orgasms for any of them. A year later, she wrote a book and described 400 women who had this spot. That's what she talked about on The Phil Donahue Show. OK, I've examined about 400 women. I found it in every single one. But this sample of 400 women was never published in a peer-reviewed journal. A later experiment in 1983 tested 11 women and found a spot in only four of them. As for that fluid that Beverly talked about when some women orgasmed, studies have found that this is perfectly normal and that the fluid is essentially urine with a little bit of secretions from glands around the urethra. So what we can see from all this is that this so-called G-spot does nothing for some women, but for others, it does give smiles. How come? The consensus that Helen and other researchers have now arrived at is that what Beverly Whipple had identified as the G-spot isn't really a spot at all. It's not some second magical clitoris on the inside of the vagina. It's actually the clitoris, which is just much bigger than we had thought. So it goes all the way down from that bit you can touch to the inside of the vaginal wall. And important to note, this newly discovered super clitoris might not be acting alone. It could be responding along with other parts around it, like the urethra and vagina. And it's kind of, it's like a core to a, a pyramid. Yeah, it's sort of wrapped around the urethra and vagina. So what Helen also discovered was that the urethra and the walls of the vagina 
share some of the same nerve supply. And preliminary work, often using very small studies, so I do want to emphasise this is preliminary work, but it does suggest that during sex, the clitoris, urethra and vagina may push, prod and excite each other, kind of like wrestlers on a mat or puppies in a basket. Ugh, anatomy's hard to describe. So interconnected are all these parts that Helen and others now argue that they should get their own name. Spot is out. Complex is the new word. Helen called it a clitoral complex. Others call it a clitoral urethral vaginal complex, or CUV. Catchy, huh? As catchy as it is, Helen says that we really should start using this anatomically correct term because it's anatomically correct. But also because when you use the term the G-spot, it makes it sound like all you have to do is press a button and whammo, multiple orgasms. It's just not as easy as the mother of the G-spot, Beverly Whipple, first made it sound. I don't have any doubt that Beverly Whipple's intentions were honourable and, and her findings faithful. But, you know, the upshot, if you're not enjoying this full range of experience, you should be. Rather than just enjoying what you're enjoying, particularly if you're, you do enjoy your sexual activity and that's not good enough somehow, you've got to go for some other level or something. And when, and when you call it a spot, it's like, really, you just feel like you've got to find that spot. Yeah, that somehow if you, you know, touch it enough or thrust it harder, that there's somehow magic's going to occur. Well, that's just a really bad paradigm. And this obsession with finding the G-spot is something that Beverly Whipple regrets unleashing on the world. Holy crap, Looking another back one? at her legacy, she says she wishes she hadn't used the word spot because ultimately it made the vagina, clitoris and orgasms seem less complex than they are. Science Versus producer Heather Rogers and I asked her about what she would have done differently. I guess we've misled people because it's more than one little spot. It's, it's a whole area. But at that point, you know, that's what we called it. So why not, why not, like, officially change the name? How do you do that? How, how would you officially change the name? Cool. If you have a way of doing it, it's fine with me. But this was way back. Nobody was doing anything. I, I, I don't know why we said spot. I really don't. You know, John and I were talking about it. We've got to name this after Grafenberg because look at what he did back in 1950. And uh, that's, just it just happened, yeah. Right now, yes, I'd like to call it a sensitive area. And the thing is, Beverly says that from the beginning, she never wanted people to go searching for a spot or hunting for magical orgasms. It's true that as far back as the early 1980s, Beverly was saying that people shouldn't be obsessed with getting an orgasm, but instead she's always wanted people to focus on all the fun stuff around it. Sometimes holding hands or touching, whatever it is that feels good to you, is an end in itself. Same as some people like someone to blow in their ears. If my husband comes near my ears, even a whisper or a barf. I mean, don't, don't, don't. Yeah. Uh, I love for him to suck on my big toe. That's like... <laughs> But we're all different. So when it comes to science versus the G-spot, does it stack up? There is no distinct anatomical feature where the G-spot supposedly is. There is no spot in the vaginal wall that every woman can press to get an orgasm. Now, if you are pressing an area in the vagina and it feels great, then great, keep pressing it. But know that it's probably the clitoris you're pressing, maybe Bert's moustache, which wraps around <laughs> the vaginal wall. And maybe the clitoris is interacting with the urethra and the vaginal wall to give you that great feeling. And yet, despite this new research, the idea of the G-spot persists. Every woman has a G-spot. Every woman does. God bless them. Why do you think the G-spot has become a, an icon, a thing, when there's very little scientific evidence behind it? It's just a really lovely idea that his pleasure with 
vaginal stimulation should be the very secret to her orgasm. So it's such a lovely idea. It just doesn't seem to be that way. And it's not just straight couples that want an easy answer to sexual pleasure. Everyone does. A spot to press to get us going? Great. But the anatomy is a lot more complicated. And here's the rub. <clears throat> We've known that women had a complex clitoris for centuries. Helen wasn't actually the first person to discover this super clitoris. She herself couldn't believe that no other anatomist before her didn't see this large, complex structure around the vagina. So she dug into the history and found out that there were good dissections from very early on. In 1561, Gabrielle Fallopia, who discovered the fallopian tubes and was a professor of anatomy at Pisa and Padua, wrote about the clitoris. He noted, quote, Modern anatomists have entirely neglected it and do not say a word about it, end quote. Fallopia wrote that almost 500 years ago. Then anatomists in the 17th and 19th centuries, they said similar things. In 1901, Gray's Anatomy, which is a Bible for anatomists, it had a label for the clitoris. But by 1948, that label and the clitoris was gone. By the way, we checked a recent edition, it's back. Helen says these are probably not accidents of history. People were actively deleting the clitoris from anatomy books. And those deletions, they ultimately created a gap that made it possible for ideas like the G-spot to take hold. Why would you start off with a good anatomy? So why wouldn't they become like the mainstay, repeat those images rather than inadequate images. Why? It's almost as if there's a power structure which throughout history has marginalised women and their experiences. But I just... I guess we'll never know. Maybe it's the lizard people that aren't giving me my diagrams of the clitoris. That's science versus the G-spot. We're taking two weeks to work on some new episodes, but when we come back, we're untangling the mysteries of hypnosis. And stick around to hear the reactions that we got from the Gimlet office when we asked them to describe the clitoris. This episode has been produced by Heather Rogers, Caitlin Kenny, Austin Mitchell, and Caitlin Sorey. Edited by Annie Rose Strasser and Alex Bloomberg. Fact-checking by Michelle Harris. Production assistance by Dr. Diane Wu and Shruti Ravindran. An extra big thanks to Lola Pellegrino, Andreas Montoya Castillo, Rose Reed, and Radio National's The Science Show. They make a great podcast. It's called The Science Show. You should check them out. Sound design and music by Matthew Boll, mixed by Martin Peralta. Music written by Bobby Lord. And this week, our intern turned producer, Austin Mitchell, leaves us. He has been absolutely wonderful and he makes this great podcast called Profiles NYC. Here's a little bit of it. One little bad thing can make you kind of like, go home, go back to South Carolina. But I'm still here. I'm still, I'm going to still fight. To find out more, head to profiles.nyc. You can see photos of all the people he interviews. Science Versus is a production of Gimlet Media. We really struggled for some time to describe what the clitoris looks like. I was going for the praying mantis for some time until I discovered this great moustache analogy. But uh, at some point we did turn to the gimlet hive mind. Here's what they thought. This looks like a pterodactyl that's been hit by a truck. <laughs> it's just like flattened. Yeah, I mean, pterodactyl's not that crazy. It almost looks like a coat hanger. Very bike rack. Like a fleshy coat hanger. All of that like schoolyard terminology for a vagina, like slash dug boot. Because you know I'm like, Wendy Zuckerman. Back to you next time. Boot. It looks like one of those magic eye pictures. Or like the the ink blot, like a cave system. And this section here, which is like looks like a frozen lava flow. 
Hi, I'm Wendy Zuckerman and you're listening to Gimlet Media's Science Versus. This is the show where we pit facts against fakers. On today's show, science versus hypnosis. Is it real? Are right. people Anyone under in mind chat, control if you're listening, or are they just Speak up. I don't know if faking. you've ever been hypnotized. To answer or these not. questions and so much more, I'm going to go on stage. I'm going to let people hypnotize me. And then we're going to pick apart the science. I just don't want him to make me balk like a chicken. I don't want him to make me do that. I want to do that of my own volition. <laughs> Recently, a few of us from Science Versus went to a hypnosis show on stage at the Mohegan Sun Casino, a sprawling complex in eastern Connecticut. Inside the casino, there is row after row of slot machines and craps tables. There's even a life-sized animatronic wolf perched on a fake cliff. Look at that. That's a wolf. That's a wolf. The wolf. The wolf just moved. Oh. <laughs> we were in... For a great Sunday night. Ladies and gentlemen, put it together oh, for the fuck. world's greatest hypnotist, your buddy and mine, Mr. Jim Spinato. We met our hypnotist, Jim, backstage before the show. He told us that he started out his career as just your standard magician until one day, a couple of decades ago, when he was asked to be the opening act for a hypnosis show. I didn't even know what that was. And then I watched his show and I was like, whoa, what is this all about? Uh, what, what made you go, whoa? Because I, I never saw people act like that on stage. You had people doing some crazy things. What kind of thing? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Jim laughed like that because he was about to make a bunch of people do some of those very same crazy come things. Come Just come, 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 come. Let's go. Come up on stage. And I'd already told him that I was going to go on stage. Yeah, oh yeah, come on. Hey, happy birthday, baby. All in the service of journalism. Oh yeah, keep coming. We need a punch, we need a punch. Around 20 people, including me, walked on stage. And soon, Jim was casting his spell. So let me ask you volunteers to sit back in your seats. Place your feet flat on the floor. Place your hands in your laps. Separate it, please. Yep. Close your eyes, volunteers. Just sit back and close your eyes. And just listen. Just listen to the music of my voice. Really, really simple. All I want you to do is to roll your eyes to the top of the ceiling as far as you can go, as if you're trying to stare at the top of your own forehead, all right? And as I do that, you're going to feel your eyes begin to get heavy, so heavy that by the time I reach zero, they'll actually close. Just stare at So I was sitting on this chair on stage, and at this point, I felt really relaxed, sort of like if you've ever meditated and the whole world kind of melts away. My head rolled down and I started to lean forward. I actually thought my head was resting on my chest, but our producers, Caitlin Sorey and Heather Rogers, who were in the audience, told me later that my head was practically in my lap. Zero. Close your eyes, everybody. Everybody close your eyes. It was then that Jim gave us his first suggestion, to put our arms out and imagine that one hand is holding a heavy ball. Based on how low your hand dropped, Jim decided who could stay and who had to go. He kicked about a dozen people off stage, leaving just seven, including me. All of us just happened to be women. It's always, it's always women here, so weird. Hmm... No faking. You can fake later on tonight if you want, but not up here. <laughs> Jim's hypnosis show is rated R. It's of the raunchy variety, so lots of swearing, lots of sex jokes. And I have to say, that, women on that stage, is pretty entertaining. He promised the crowd If anyone has a chance to go to something like that, I'd definitely begin. recommend it. Jim started off with something easy, what? suggesting that the person sitting next to us smelled unbelievably good. When do you smell that? <laughs> yes, no? Okay. You can't hear it, but I said no. I was a bit foggy, and maybe I was starting to smell something sweet, but whatever state I was in, I snapped out of it immediately as soon as I saw the woman next to me leaping off her chair and starting to sniff the lady next to her. But she didn't just sniff her like a regular person. She buried her head deep <laughs> into her crutch. Oh, the geez. crowd went nuts. <laughs> That was the moment I realised I had to get off stage. 
So I did. Oh. But everyone else stayed on. And under hypnosis, they ended up giving the audience lap dances. They got high smoking imaginary weed. They rapped. Yeah, can't stop laughing. They heard noises coming out of their vaginas. And real estate agent Lauren was sent roaming around the club looking for a lost poodle called Twat. Twat! Twat! So what in the world was happening on that stage? Were those women really just putty in Jim Spinato's hands, unable to stop themselves from following his every suggestion? Or were they just a bunch of attention seekers faking it for the crowd? Well... The thing is, Either entertainers way, aren't the is very only ones who have been using hypnosis over the years. Some doctors and scientists have been hypnotising patients for centuries with the ultimate goal of improving people's physical and mental health as well as changing bad habits. Give them a suggestion to quit smoking and whammo, they're looking for a dog named Twat. Joking, obviously not. Presumably the ziggies are in the trash and they never have an urge to smoke again. But does hypnosis really work like that? On today's show, we're pushing science verses to the edge of consciousness to answer the following questions. One, what is hypnosis? Two, can everyone be hypnotized? Three, what is happening in your brain when you're under? And four, what can hypnosis make you do? Like, how good is the evidence that it really can help you quit smoking? When it comes to mind control, there are lots of opinions. But then, there's science. Let's start with the basics. What exactly is hypnosis? Professor Philip Muskin is a psychiatrist at Columbia University in New York. The only thing you have to be careful with these chairs is they totally have a mind of their own. So if you move even a little, <laughs> correct. For more than three decades, he has been treating his patients with hypnosis. And he says that even after all these years, he can still remember one of the first times he saw someone get hypnotised. It was a doctor who was being hypnotised by another doctor. The hypnotist gave his subject a very simple but rather terrifying suggestion. You cannot separate your fingers. No force on earth will allow you to separate your fingers. When you open your eyes, your fingers will be fused together. You cannot separate them. So he brought her out of the trance, and her hands are like this, and he gives her a cup of coffee, and she goes to take it and just falls on the ground. I'm amazed. She then did her neurology residency here at the hospital I'm at now. And I ran into her one day. By then, I was a psychiatry resident, so she was now a senior neurology resident. And I said, I got, I've been meaning to ask you this for years. So here we are. What was going on? She said, I don't know. He told me I couldn't take my fingers apart. I couldn't take my fingers apart. He gave me the damn cup of coffee. I made a mess. I was embarrassed, but I couldn't take my fingers apart. Seeing this astounded Philip. He went on to study hypnosis, and now he regularly uses the technique on his patients for a variety of conditions, like relieving pain and helping people with their phobias. Philip also teaches hypnosis to medical students. He showed us how to hypnotize someone. Look into my eyes. Nah, that was just his Dracula impersonation. Okay, no, here it is. This is how you actually hypnotise someone. And you'll notice that the words that Professor Philip Muskin uses are pretty similar to what Jim said on stage at the Mohegan Sun Casino. Roll your eyes up. Roll them up as high as they'll go. And keeping your eyeballs up, slowly close your eyelids, take a deep breath, deep, 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 deep. When I ask it. you to do this, all I want you to do is to roll your eyes to the top of the ceiling as far as you can go, as if you're trying Philip to... says that you can do a lot of things to hypnotize someone. You don't have to roll your eyes up or take a deep breath. You can show them a spinning spiral or even dangle that old movie classic. The gold watch floating back and forth in front of your eyes. And those are all techniques that work. So... They work. The gold watch works. Sure, but they, they all. <laughs> I thought it was. They all work for the same reason that the person starts to concentrate, concentrate his or yeah. her attention in a very narrow focus. Philip says that when you're so focused and the rest of the world just melts away, and all you can hear is the hypnotist's voice, you are entering a trance. Yep, that's seriously that's what Philip and to our academics call it. A trance. Now, Philip says there are a few components to hypnosis. 
absorption, dissociation, and suggestibility. Absorption really means that you narrow your focus. You're absorbed. Dissociation means things that are normally one are separated. And suggestibility means that social cues that you might ignore, are, are more, you're more open to them. Once suggestibility kicks in, the hypnotist makes suggestions to you, like smelling the woman next to you or keeping your hands clasped together. Then the hypnotist basically wakes you up and ends the trance. Now in a minute, I'm going to have you open your eyes. Don't do anything, just listen. At three. three. You could start to move around your seats a little bit. Why don't you do that now? Just get a little bit of energy going on, okay? Four, almost awake. On the next number, your eyes will open. At that point, you'll be wide, wide, wide awake, feeling excellent. You'll Ready? feel refreshed, like you'd taken a short nap. Conclusion. To put someone under, you first focus them, get them absorbed, then give them suggestions. And finally, you wake them up. Oh, and other than the cocktails and the lap dances, what hypnotists do on stage can actually be quite similar to what doctors do in the office. Next question. Is everyone on stage and in Philip's office actually hypnotised? Because there is a problem that plagues hypnotists, and that is fakers. People pretending to be under and carrying out the suggestions just because they want to. Either they want to please the crowd or maybe they want to please their doctor. And the thing is that even scientists have trouble spotting a faker. Even with fancy schmancy technology like MRI scanners that can map the brain, there is no consistent marker for when the brain is under a hypnotic trance. But a paper reviewing the current state of the science, which cited almost 100 articles published in 2013, concluded that the scientific consensus on hypnosis reckons there is more to it than faking. Some people, they noted, do have genuine experiences of feeling in some kind of trance. So, while some people, when it comes to hypnosis, are surely faking, let's focus on what is happening to the people who aren't. Turns out that some are more likely to go under and follow suggestions than others. What makes these people so highly hypnotizable? Studies with identical twins suggest that there is a genetic link between people who are highly hypnotizable. So it's a trait that could be inherited, but not all identical twins showed a strong genetic link. So there's probably more at play than genetics. And just like you can't use genes to pick out a highly hypnotizable person, according to Philip, you also can't look at someone and accurately guess who is hypnotizable. There are uh, people who are very hypnotizable, but they wear three-piece suits. There are people who dress in a flighty way and everyone thinks, oh, she's hypnotizable and she's anything but hypnotizable. You can be weak-willed and not be hypnotizable at all and extremely strong-willed, and be very hypnotizable. And there are no biological tests for who is or isn't highly hypnotizable. There's no blood test or brain scan. The only way to know, say researchers, is to hypnotize people and then ask them to do a series of increasingly complicated tasks while they're under. It's a test, and based on what people do or don't do, the scientists give them a ranking of hypnotizability. There are several of these tests, two of the most frequently used are from Harvard and Stanford. And when scientists use these tests to rank hypnotizability, they've found that like most personality traits, being extroverted or neurotic, hypnotizability falls into a spectrum, where most people are in the middle, 10 to 15% are highly hypnotizable, and then there are very few incredibly hypnotizable people. These are people who will follow extremely complicated suggestions. On stage, Jim's hypnosis didn't really work on me, but I wanted to see how I would go in a clinical setting. You know, with a real professional. Look into my eyes. Philip gave me a short hypnotizability test, and he used this simple scoring system from zero to five. Zero, not hypnotizable at all. Five, very hypnotizable. He put me under, then told me my arm felt tingly, and it kind of started to feel a bit tingly. Then, after a couple more suggestions, he got me out of it. 
Open up your eyelids. Open them up and bring them into focus. How do you feel? Uh, yeah, I, I feel very, um, a little bit drugged out. Drugged out. The most similar to when I've felt like this before. Okay. Is it a good feeling or a bad feeling? Uh, it's like a little bit woozy making. A little bit woozy. Okay. So as you could hear, I sound pretty groggy and that really surprised me. For five minutes of just focusing my attention, for my head to go all foggy, that was odd. And it led Philip Muskin to tell me... You're actually hypnotizable. Sorry to, to disappoint you. What number? What number am I? You're at least a three. At least a three? Who wants to be highly hypnotizable? I want it to be a zero. I don't want people messing with my head in a way that's out of my control. Which brings us to Amanda Barnier. I'm a professor of cognitive science in the Department of Cognitive Science at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. And she studies extremely hypnotizable people, people at the top end of that scale that Philip used on me. And she writes about them in peer-reviewed journals. So she told me about one case of a man called Blake, which isn't his real name. She put him under hypnosis and then she gave him a rather remarkable suggestion. In a moment, I'm going to get you to look into a mirror and you're going to see a stranger, not yourself. And then I said, okay, lean forward, open your eyes and look in the mirror. And he opens his eyes and he looks in the mirror and then he looks around the room and he looks at me and he looks around the room and I said, who is it? And what do you see? And he said, it's not me. I said, do you know who it is? And he said, yeah, oh, I think it's a guy that I used to go to school with. And I said, do you, does he look like you? And he said, um, no. Amanda pushed Blake and he kept saying the person he could see in the mirror was definitely not him. He said, well, his eyes are smaller, his nose is bigger, he's got freckles. So, yeah, that's absolutely one of the most compelling sessions that I've ever sat in. And Blake wasn't the only one. In total, Amanda convinced 14 out of 22 highly hypnotizable subjects that they were seeing a stranger when they looked in the mirror. And of these, 10 said they had never seen this person in the mirror before, two said they had seen the person before, and another two just weren't sure. She also tried this out on people with low hypnotizability, and it didn't work. Conclusion, there is a spectrum of hypnotizability. Most people are in the middle, but there are a few super hypnos. Trademark, science versus. These are incredibly hypnotizable people that can be made to not recognize themselves in the mirror. After the break, what's going on in the brain of a super hypno? And how far can you take these highly hypnotizable people when they're under? This episode is brought to you by Indeed. When you need to hire fast, use Indeed. They're the hiring platform where you can do it all. And they have powerful hiring tools that can help you find top talent quickly, like Indeed Matching. As soon as you sponsor a job post, it'll match you up with qualified candidates that you can invite to apply. So start hiring at warp speed and join the millions already using Indeed. Tap the banner to start hiring now or visit Indeed.com science. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. I'm Yasi Salek, and I'm the host of Bandsplain, a show where we explain cult bands and iconic artists by going deep into their histories and discographies. We're back with a brand new season at our brand new home, the Ringer Podcast Network, tackling a whole new batch of artists, from grunge gods to power pop pioneers to new metal legends, and many, many more. Listen to new episodes every Thursday, only on Spotify. Welcome back. So, what is happening in the mind of highly hypnotizable people? Are they under some weird kind of mind control? Well, there is a much simpler explanation. Placebo. Like the way that taking a sugar pill that you believe is a painkiller can cure a headache. Could believing that hypnosis is real and magical make you experience it as real and magical? Professor Amir Raz is a researcher of cognitive science at McGill University in Montreal. The whole hypnosis thing can be construed as some kind of a complex placebo effect. 
where things happen just because you believe they're about to happen. And some academics do think of hypnosis this way. They point to studies which show that people's preconceived ideas about what happens when you go under influence what happens when you go under. Think about those women on stage at the casino. They did all these things that comedian Jim Spinato wanted them to do. And under this placebo theory, they did those things because they went into the comedy club expecting that that's what being hypnotised would be like. But there is debate here. Other researchers argue that expectation and placebo isn't so important in hypnosis, and they have studies to back up their opinions. It's this conflicting evidence that led Amir to build what he calls the funny room. There is a system, a clandestine system, a, a hidden system of some speakers in the ceiling, and we told them that only highly hypnotizable people can hear a mosquito flying in the room. Then, Amir pretends to hypnotise these subjects. And then, he starts to play recordings of mosquitoes flying very faintly through these hidden speakers. And then they say, you know, goodness. So, picture it. People think they are deeply hypnotised. They're not. And they hear a buzzing sound that they think they're hearing because they're under hypnosis. But really, it's just playing on the speakers. And Amir says this is just the first step of the experiment. When they come out of the funny room, they are sort of empowered to think that they're highly hypnotizable. And we wanted to see if we, when we empower people to be highly hypnotizable, regardless of whether they are or aren't, if they would then perform like a highly hypnotizable person. So after all this trickery, Amir actually hypnotized the participants and gave them suggestions. He then repeated the experiment in a variety of ways, all with one goal – to answer the question, would people who expect to be super responsive to hypnosis perform like people who actually are highly hypnotizable? And the answer is that they don't. That is, they didn't do all the things that Amir asked, things that truly hypnotizable people would do. Meaning that people's expectations don't fully explain how they react to real hypnosis which has led Amir to believe that hypnosis cannot be completely explained by placebo. I can very emphatically say that a large part of what hypnosis is, is placebo, but then again, I'm not for a second claiming that hypnosis is only placebo. A 2006 experiment, charmingly titled Expect the Unexpected, which came from a different team of researchers, also found that expectation could not fully explain how people respond to hypnosis. They wrote that the idea that it's all expectation, quote, seems too extreme, end quote. Conclusion. The placebo effect can explain some of why hypnosis works, but it appears that it doesn't explain everything. So, what else is going on in these highly hypnotizable people? For decades, researchers have probed the brains of these people, trying to answer this very question using brain scanners, MRIs or PET scanners. And some of these small studies have found that the brains of people who are experiencing something under hypnosis look an awful lot like the brains of people who are actually experiencing the real thing. Let me give you an example. So there was this study of a man who was hypnotised and told that he couldn't move his leg. And the researchers found that the activity of two areas in his brain looked really similar to a person who actually had this condition known as hysteria paralysis. It's a rare psychological condition where you can't move a body part, in this case, a leg. The paper was published in The Lancet. In another study, researchers scanned the brains of eight highly hypnotizable people while they played them an audio recording of a generic sentence with no particular significance. This is what it was. The man did not speak often, but when he did, it was worth hearing what he had to say. And they played it over and over and over again so that it would get stuck in the subject's mind. The man did not speak often, the man but when did he not did speak, not speak it often, but when, but when he did, it, it was worth hearing what he had to say. Then, the people were hypnotized and told that they were hearing the recording again. The man did not speak. But they weren't. They were just hypnotized and thought they were hearing it. Finally, the people were told to imagine hearing the line. No hypnosis this time, just thinking about it. 
The man, the man did not speak that. often, but when he did, it was worth hearing what he had to say. The researchers found that when the people heard the recording, a particular area of their brain lit up. And when they were hypnotised, that same area also lit up, just like when they were hearing it. But when they were told to merely imagine the recording, when they weren't hypnotised at all, that part of the brain stayed dark. The same effect has been seen when people are hypnotised and told that they're feeling pain and even when they're told they can't see colour. Now, within these brain studies, there's a particular area of the noggin that comes up over and over again. It's called the anterior cingulate cortex. It's a hook-shaped node in the middle of the front of the brain. And it seems to affect how we perceive the world around us. There's even evidence suggesting that it affects how we perceive our own pain. So if this area gets tweaked during hypnosis, it kind of makes sense that it would change a person's perception of reality. Here's Amir again. If the anterior cingulate cortex begins to monitor behavior differently and decides that something is sad when it's not so sad, or the other way around, that something is really funny when it's not so funny, this would bring about a very dramatic change in behavior. Very dramatic. Now, all this research suggests that a hypnotist is kind of controlling people's minds. But there are problems with these studies. For one, they're often really small. Plus, it's really hard to interpret the brain. Yes, areas of the brain light up in particular patterns, but the brain is lighting up in different ways all the time. And it's very hard to control for these variables, particularly when you have so few people in a given study. So, For example, when we look back at that leg paralysis study where the man's brain lit up in two areas just like a real patient with hysteria paralysis, well, recently that same group of researchers looked at 12 other people, repeated the general experiment and couldn't replicate their results. And just to make my brain hurt and maybe your brain hurt a little bit more, while those leg studies that we talked about used PET scanners, many others have used MRIs. And a study out this year found that some computer programs used to interpret MRI scans are actually spitting out unreliable results, making areas of the brain look like they're lighting up when actually they aren't. The implications of this work are still being nutted out and the results of that study will need to be replicated. But meanwhile, here's how Philip summed up our current knowledge of the brain under hypnosis. So we can look at the brain and we can, to some extent, look at the brain functioning. But there's a lot that goes on we don't have a clue about. Conclusion. Some studies suggest that the brain is affected in powerful ways under hypnosis but there can be real issues with interpreting some of these studies. So for now, the hypnotised brain remains a mystery. Next question. So even though we don't know what is happening in the brain under hypnosis, there is still this question of what we can actually make people do when they're under. Now, one way to answer this question would be to push people to their limits, really make them do something under hypnosis that they would never want to do. Amanda Barnier pushes her subjects pretty far. He said, it's not me. It's not me. But even she has her limits. I don't know how far, and I don't know that, and it's not ethical to test how far that mind control will go. I haven't tested, and I don't know where the limit is. There's going to be a limit somewhere. Um... I don't want to test it. (laughs) Ugh, academics with their pesky ethics. Well, there's one organisation that doesn't have to worry about those. The CIA. And in fact, in the 1950s, they looked at how far you could push hypnosis using covert programmes with adorable names like Project Bluebird, Project Artichoke and the less adorable MKUltra. A partially redacted CIA memo summarised their thoughts on the potentials of hypnosis. 5th of May, 1955. Subject, hypnotism and covert operations. I apologise for submitting a document as long as this one. The subject is highly controversial, and even this treatment, which may appear long, is abbreviated. Don't just get to the important bit. Is this a part of, like, our... Is this what we're doing? Is this a part of, like, us acting? Yeah. Okay, because that really surprised me. 
The possibilities are not only interesting, they are frightening. A kind of double-think Orwellian world of hypnosis, while unlikely, is not utterly fantastic. The CIA knew this Orwellian world was unlikely because of studies they cited in their declassified documents, like this one, where researchers told a deeply hypnotised woman to stab and poison several people. She did so, without even hesitating. But when they told her to undress, she snapped out of her hypnotised state and refused. The thing is, she knew the murders weren't real, and they weren't. The researchers had used rubber daggers and sugar pills for the poison. But the undressing? That was real, and she could tell the difference. Which is why, in 1960, the CIA concluded in a declassified report... It appears extremely doubtful that trance can be induced in resistant subjects. So that's the CIA. And 50 years later, Jim Spinato and his R-rated hypnosis show also ran up against those limits. He got those women to do some pretty weird stuff on stage when they were under. Here's Lauren, the real estate agent. She did most of Jim's suggestions, but not one. Jim suggested that she go nuts making out with her husband when Jim would say the words... Pinkies, 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 pinkies! Jim said that she wouldn't be able to control herself with her husband. Now, Lauren sat in her husband's lap, kissed him a little, but that was it. At that point, I already was, okay, there's a lot of people here and that's inappropriate. Let's just kiss like normal people. Okay, so hypnosis probably won't make us undress in front of strangers or maul our husband on stage if we actually don't want to do that. But what about the smaller things, things we might actually want to do, like quit smoking, lose weight, sleep better, or maybe even stop pain, say, during childbirth? There are lots of claims out there that hypnosis can do the trick for all of these things. But the problem is there just isn't enough good evidence to show whether or not hypnosis works for any of these. Yes, there have been clinical trials, but sometimes they aren't particularly good quality. They typically don't have a lot of people within them, and scientists use different ways to hypnotise their subjects in different studies, which makes it really difficult to compare results and come up with solid findings. It also makes it really difficult to say the likelihood that hypnosis can help you. Conclusion. Even highly hypnotizable people probably won't do everything they're told to by a hypnotist. Best we can tell, there are limits. Even when you go into a trance, you can probably snap yourself out of it. Which takes us back to my greatest fear, being forced to make animal noises while I'm under hypnosis. Straight after Philip Muskin hypnotized me in his office, I asked him, With more work, could you make me quack like a duck? If you wanted to. That is, if you wanted during the experience to be disinhibited in that way. For me, I guess the, the, whether it's the say to bark like a duck or bark like a dog or quack like a duck, that would be evidence for me about the power of hypnosis, I guess. That, the power of hypnosis is internal. What you're saying is that would be evidence of my power over you. That is not how hypnosis works. So, when it comes to science versus hypnosis, does it stack up? First, does hypnosis really work? Well, on stage, there's peer pressure and wanting to get a laugh. So it's hard to know how many of those people are faking it. And in fact, even in the lab, picking out a faker can be a problem. But based on the research we have found, hypnosis does seem to be a real thing. Next, can everyone be hypnotised? No, but most of us probably can. People fall along a spectrum of hypnotizability, and about 10 to 15% of people are highly hypnotizable. Okay, now, what is happening in your brain when you are under? Well, that is something that scientists are very much still trying to figure out. For people who do seem to be highly hypnotizable, there is a chance that what we're seeing isn't them under hypnosis, but rather the placebo effect in action. But 
Placebo doesn't explain all experiences of hypnosis. Still, according to the science, you're not under a spell or someone else's control. And for now, there is no evidence that you entirely lose control of yourself. So if hypnosis isn't all faking, and it's not all placebo, and it's not mind control, what is it? Here's the best answer we got. When your mind is truly focused and all you can hear is the hypnotist's voice, you're just more likely to follow suggestions. Hearing this just baffled me a lot. So I asked Philip Muskin about it. The trance and the, the, the being very, very focused, I can completely understand. But the fact that then your mind is more malleable it's more likely to be suggestible when you're concentrating. How does that happen? What is the, what, how does that happen? So how does it work? We don't, we don't know. And of course, whenever we don't know how something works, it either makes us think it's false, BS of some sort. But you don't. I don't. I don't from my personal experience. I don't from my experience with patients. Does it frustrate you that there's not a mechanism at play that we know about? We don't know about so much that, uh, you know, truly, if you get yourself caught up in all the things we don't know, uh, the world seems hopeless. I'll give you a common example. Falling in love. Most everybody falls in love. You see somebody and you say hello and they're pretty much in love at that moment. Boom. What is that? And we could come up with stuff but we're making it up. So while a lot of hypnosis remains a mystery, it does seem that there is something about being so completely focused on the words that someone tells you. So completely focused on the words that someone tells you that everything else just fades away, just fades away. And you are so focused on the words that you hear so focused on the words that you hear that you just nod your heads and you start to walk, 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 like a chicken. That's science versus hypnosis. This episode has been produced by Heather Rogers, Caitlin Kenny, Austin Mitchell, Dr. Diane Wu, and Truti Ravindran. Our senior producer is Caitlin Sorey. Edited by Annie Rose Strasser and fact-checking by Michelle Harris. Sound design and music production by Matthew Boll, mixed by Martin Peralta. Music written by Martin Peralta and Bobby Lord. Thanks to Alex Bloomberg for being the man that spoke pretty often in the end. It was worth hearing what you had to say. And Jonathan Goldstein for being our CIA agent. And if you like the sound of that CIA agent... That really surprised me. Then you will love Jonathan's new show. It's called Heavyweight. You can subscribe now heavy weight and hang around for a preview of it in just a moment science versus is a production of gimlet media next week we're looking at zika should you be worried and why is it becoming a big deal now it's like i got some primals. i'm wendy zuckerman back to you next time choose your own offline listening adventure Spotify Premium lets you download and take your music on the go. Try three free months of Premium now and cancel any time. Tap the banner to learn more. If it seems like there are a lot of people quitting their jobs right now, it's because they are. We're working so hard that we forgot to think about what makes us happy. I would just sit at my desk and cry. I just got to the point where I had to say, I don't know if I can do this. And it's not just quitting. There's a lot of unusual things happening in the economy. Car shortages, soaring lumber prices, inflation. We cover all this and more on The Journal Podcast, out every weekday afternoon. Tap now to listen to The Journal on Spotify. Hi, I'm Wendy Zuckerman, and you're listening to Science Versus from Gimlet Media. This is the show where we pit facts against friggin' mosquitoes. Today, we're tackling one of the biggest science puzzles of 2016. 
the explosion of the Zika virus. This year was the first time that many people would have heard of the Zika virus. And we got a sobering update on Zika. The Zika virus. The Zika virus and its potentially devastating consequences continues to spread. Warning that the Zika virus appears to be a lot scarier than first thought. Photos of babies born with small heads, a condition called microcephaly, have been dominating the news all year. And the cause? Zika. Now, it's clear that this virus is spreading. Since 2015, there have been Zika outbreaks reported in 60 countries, most recently in Singapore and Thailand. This news has put a lot of questions into a lot of people's minds. So today, we're going to be discussing some of them. Firstly, where did Zika come from? Second, what happens when you get infected? Third, how worried should you be if you live or are traveling to a Zika-affected part of the world? And finally, why has Zika become such a problem recently? Since a lot of the science on Zika is still underway, we're bringing you a very different kind of Science Versus episode this week. There are just so many unknowns that it's too soon to be bringing you conclusions, so you won't be hearing the old bow bow or ding 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 that we just love so much on Science Versus. Instead, we're going to have a series of conversations with experts who study Zika. These are scientists who look at how it spreads and how it attacks the human body. Okay, so let's start with Zika's origin story. New York Times reporter Donald McNeil Jr. wrote a book about the Zika epidemic earlier this year, and he's followed the recent outbreak very closely. We brought him in to talk about the discovery of Zika, and Donald told us that Zika was first found by researchers in 1947 in the dense Zika forest in Uganda. It was first spotted in a monkey that scientists had strategically placed as bait to attract mosquitoes. Here's Donald. In that forest, they had built a lot of towers which reached up into the treetops and they had monkeys suspended in cages in those towers. They had the monkeys up there basically to be bitten by mosquitoes and then they took them down every day and took their temperatures and checked on their general health. And so they were, the monkeys were in the cages yes. on the treetops. At different heights. At different heights. Yep. Welcome to 1940s <laughs> medical research. Absolutely. And that's, this was completely ethical at the time. So Risu 766 had a fever and they brought it down, took it to the lab and did a blood draw. This was a monkey with the poetically titled name. Yes. 766. Oh, well, you know, virtually all research monkeys are known by their numbers. So they pulled down. They pulled down the monkey. It had a temperature. So they decided to start looking in its, in its blood to see what it had. And the actual process of figuring out what this was and the fact that it wasn't something already known. It wasn't yellow fever. It wasn't dengue. It wasn't semleaky forest virus. It wasn't bunyamero virus. It wasn't all these other viruses that they knew about, which nobody's ever heard of because they haven't come out of the forest and gotten us yet, but all of which could. To do that work took several years. Ultimately, they realized, hey, it's something new, and they named it Zika virus after the forest where the monkey had been infected. Do we know who was the first human patient to get sick with Zika? Was there a patient zero? We know who the first human in whom the Zika virus was discovered. She was a 10-year-old girl in Nigeria. They did some research, interesting research then where they actually drew blood from an entire village near the lab in Nigeria to see if they had what we now know are antibodies to Zika and like 60% of the village did. Okay, so the fact that 60% of the village had antibodies to Zika suggests that those people were actually infected with the virus at one point in their lives. And Donald says that even though Zika wasn't discussed in the scientific community until around the 1950s, Zika has probably been around parts of Africa for thousands of years, infecting monkeys and people. But Donald says that Zika really wasn't considered to be so scary. That Nigerian girl, she had a headache and a fever, but that was about it. It was a relatively mild disease. There was a scientist who deliberately gave himself Zika in order to describe the effects. Uh, and uh, Europeans, they just got to make it about them, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> he uh, injected himself and then described the effects on, on himself of the, the fever. But it was a relatively mild disease. Okay, so after this buzz of research, no pun intended, some pun intended, for the next six decades, Zika was only mentioned about a dozen times in the scientific literature. And when it was, it was describing just a few people who were infected in Senegal, Pakistan, Indonesia, Cambodia. 
But no one got that sick, no deaths, no hospitalizations, just fever, rashes and chills. And again, not that many people got infected at once. But then in 2007, Zika turns up in a big way on the island of Yap. Yap is a tiny island in the Pacific Ocean, just north of Papua New Guinea and east of the Philippines. So a doctor on Yap contacted the Centers for Disease Control and said, hey, we're having some sort of outbreak. Can you help me figure out what's going on? Here's Donald again. So a team went from the CDC there and they, you know, started seeing patients and pulled blood and said, this is Zika virus. It hit the island. It, it um, hit 73% of the island population within six months and then disappeared. That was it. End of, end of epidemic. And there hasn't been a case on Yap Island since. In Yap, did we start to see s- serious complications, microcephaly, things like that? No. In Yap, um, it was considered a mild virus. So how did we get from hundreds of people on an island in the Pacific with just flu-like symptoms to the situation that we have now? Well, the first hint that Zika could become serious was when the infection hit French Polynesia. This was in 2013. It was estimated that 30,000 people, roughly 10% of the population, went to the doctor because of Zika infections. And it was during this outbreak that doctors started seeing an unusual increase in another condition, Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is a temporary and very rare disease which can lead to paralysis and it can come on very suddenly. Usually, maybe a couple of people on these islands might be affected by this in a year. But during the outbreak, 41 people with Zika infections got it. Then we started hearing about Zika hitting Brazil. By the end of 2015, the Brazil Ministry of Health estimated that between 500,000 to 1.5 million people were infected with Zika. And then things got worse. Their small faces number in the thousands in Brazil. Their mothers worried about developmental delay because of microcephaly. And how did the Brazil government because they were the first to realize this connection. It was actually individual doctors in Brazil who noticed it. Doctors who worked in the pediatric intensive care units suddenly began saying to each other, hey, I've got five babies with microcephaly in my unit. And actually one of them was a, was a mother-daughter team. They were both pediatric intensive care specialists at different hospitals. And they, they began talking to each other and saying, I've got seven in my hospital. You know, I don't normally don't see a baby with microcephaly more than, you know, once a year or once every couple of years, you know, something's going on. And so the doctors began consulting with each other and they realized that something terribly alarming was going on. The doctors in Brazil started to suspect that Zika was causing the microcephaly pretty much because of the timing. A bunch of new cases of Zika and then several months later, a bunch of new cases of microcephaly. So to explain how a mother being bit by a mosquito can suddenly produce babies with abnormally small heads, we talked to Desiree Lebeau, an associate professor of paediatric infectious diseases at Stanford University. Desiree specializes in diseases spread by mosquitoes and she loves her job and loves what she studies. I'm an arborologist. (laughs) <laughs> so all arborologists love their arboviruses. What exactly but, is an arbovirus? Yeah, so an ar- arbovirus stands for arthropod borne virus. So this is a virus that uses a blood-sucking arthropod to complete its life cycle. I study ones that are spread mainly by mosquitoes, but you can have other arboviruses that are spread by other arthropod vectors, like ticks and, and other insects. Now, tell me, how exactly, I mean, I know there's lots of unknowns here, but what do we know? How exactly does the Zika virus cause microcephaly? So right now, the thinking is, is that when a woman is infected, um, you know, she has the virus in her bloodstream, that virus can then cross over the placental barrier into the placenta, and then it travels into the developing fetus, and it has sort of what we call neurotropism. So it it actually is sort of drawn to the neural structures of the developing fetal brain. And so it infects those structures, you know, inhibiting their normal growth processes. Microcephaly is one aspect of, of the congenital Zika virus syndrome, but there, as, as time goes on, you know, we're starting to understand more and more of the entire bell-shaped curve. So when you say a bell-shaped curve, you mean there might be more subtle things going on rather than just microcephaly? 
Absolutely. So microcephaly is an easy thing to see, right? When the child is born and their head is very small, it's an easy thing for someone to pick up. But there are probably going to be more and more subtle effects of Zika virus infection on babies. Probably not all those babies will have microcephaly. Maybe some will have hearing deficits. Some may have vision deficits. Some may have other learning problems or other um, deformities within the brain. And I wasn't around when the rubella virus was found to be a congenitally exposed virus and caused problems with you know babies whose moms happened to get rubella during pregnancy. But I was told in the 50s and 60s when that was going on that yes, initially you know they saw microcephaly, but then as time went on, they started to realize, oh, there were other eye complications that are due to rubella, there are heart complications that are due to rubella, and so forth. And so that came out later. And I think that's just what we'll find with Zika. I think microcephaly is sort of like the tip of the iceberg, and we'll probably find a lot of other long-standing complications from in utero exposure. And, and what about in adults? Are we seeing that, that Zika likes to uh, attack the brains of adults as well? Many, many arboviruses are able to cause infection of the brain because a lot of them are so neurotropic. And so it's possible that Zika virus will join its, you know, join its friends, the other arboviruses, and be able to you know, cause these, these sort of spectra of disease in adults. But what I can say is that it does look like Zika virus has been associated with increased risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Remember that rare form of paralysis, Guillain-Barre syndrome? Well, during the Zika outbreak in Brazil, they did see more of it. Still very rare, but it did pop up more and more. It's a reversible phenomenon. Usually you aren't left with long-standing health complications after you suffer from Guillain-Barre, but you do need to be supported during that time when you're most ill. Like from the virus's perspective, why is it so attracted to the brain and the nerve system? What's it doing once it's there? I'm not sure if we know that exactly. Um, at this time, it, there are lots of people working on, you know, how does it cross the placental barrier? And there are Desiree told us that one of the big ideas about how Zika is causing microcephaly is this. Zika gets inside brain cells by unlocking what are called receptors on the cells of fetuses developing brains. You can think of receptors as little locks that protect the cells, and to get inside these cells, you need a key. Zika seems to have that key. And that means that Zika can get inside fetuses' brains and cause havoc. Yes, exactly. So it could be that, yeah, the Zika virus has the key, and then all of these these early brain cells have the lock and does the, the placenta. So the virus is actually able to use that, that key lock to get across the placental barrier and then set up shop in the developing brain. Is the Zika virus replicating in the brain cells as well? Yes. Can you take us through that process? Like, does it use human cells to make itself replicate? Yeah, that's usually what viruses do. So they sort of set up shop and make your cells a viral factory. And then that, you know, that one cell will produce many, many, many viruses that will then go on to infect other cells and so forth. And in um, the case of Zika virus infection, unlike the herpes virus infections, it doesn't really stay behind and integrate in your host genetic material. It doesn't integrate into your DNA. It just comes in, it sets up shop, and it you know, kills the cell that it set the shop up in. Tell me, there's lots of concern out there. How worried should people be? So, so what are the chances that your baby will get microcephaly if you're infected with Zika and you're pregnant? We don't know the numbers. You know, I, I can't say what the, what the risk is. I would say for pregnant women here in the U.S., you want to avoid being in an area that's having Zika virus transmission right now because we don't know those answers yet. And there, there isn't a 100% way that you can uh, protect yourself from mosquitoes. We can try and do our very best with you know, protecting ourselves using personal protective equipment, wearing pants and long sleeves, wearing DEET or Picaridin, you know, some effective mosquito repellent. But, um, you know, there's not a 100% chance that you're going to protect yourself completely, right? And so if you can't avoid traveling to those places, you should, when you're, especially when you're pregnant. As for a healthy adult with a normal immune system, you know, if you get Zika virus infection, this is probably unlikely to do you great harm. Quick note, 80% of people infected with Zika don't even show symptoms. No outward physical signs at all. Okay, carry on, Desiree. You are sick for a few days with fever. You might have an itchy rash and some red eyes, and you might feel 
unwell for a few days, but then your body clears the virus and then and you get back to your normal health after. You know, if you're one of the unlucky few who has a severe complication from Zika like Jan Barre, that will, you know, that that is it can lead to severe disease, but most people are going to just have the sort of easier week long, you know, febrile syndrome from it. And so if you plan to get pregnant in one or two or three years, would it be a problem to be infected with Zika now? No, I don't believe so. Because if you're a healthy adult, you're just going to have virus in your bloodstream for a few days and then it'll go away. You'll clear the infection and you'll make antibodies that will protect you from future infections. And so you have actually pr you've protected yourself. It's not going to set up shop in your brain when you get infected and then be around years later when you want to have a baby. You will clear that virus within a week or two. So is it actually a good idea to get Zika now before you want to get pregnant so you have some kind of immunity? That's like when they like have a like a Zika party like they used to throw chicken pox parties for kids back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that. I think you should protect yourself, avoid, you know, avoid travel and and wait for effective, you know, vaccines and and therapeutics to come out. I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest that everybody should have a throw a Zika party. Why not? Even though it's a relatively, you know, benign viral infection when you're a healthy adult, it's still terrible to get sick for that long and I think that um you know, the, the, the risk for maybe severe disease would still be there also. Even though it's small, it's still a risk. And so at this time, I think people should just, you know, be smart, travel wisely, and, and protect yourself from mosquitoes. And so you think there's, there is really no need to be concerned about having a Zika infection now and that infection staying in your body until even a month, if you want to get pregnant, even a month after infection. The CDC has come out with recommendations for this. You probably, you know, want to wait three months after, after you've had your Zika virus infection to attempt getting pregnant. And given there's quite a bit that we don't know about Zika, how can they be so confident with that recommendation? I think they're just looking at the evidence that they have now and trying to sort of give the best estimates. Um, I think, uh, you know, the reason why I can feel confident saying that Zika doesn't sit around, you know, and isn't ready to come and, and get your baby three years later is because, again, your your body clears this virus. This is not a virus like a herpes virus that would stay with you, stay within your cells and then rear its ugly head when you get stressed out and then you get a cold sore. It's not that type of virus. It's not a DNA virus that's going to do that. This is a virus that's going to come in and you know kill the cells that it infects right then and then your body's going to deal with it and then it's over. Um, with all the other arboviral infections, that's exactly what happens. You, you, know, you get the infection, your body clears the infection, and then you're protected from that infection. There have been studies that have shown that the people who have Zika that you can't even get a positive test result for Zika virus in your bloodstream, you know, if it's been seven days since your initial fever. It's already gone out of your bloodstream. So there is evidence to support that the virus is gone pretty quickly after you get the infection. And so um, I think that's why the CDC and others feel pretty confident saying that, you know, there isn't going to be any harm to a fetus further on down the line once you've cleared your, your Zika virus infection. Just to clarify, the CDC recommends that women should wait at least eight weeks after possible exposure to Zika before trying to get pregnant. But to be sure, Desiree recommends three months. Now, Desiree acknowledges that right now we don't have any long-term studies on people infected with Zika, which means that even though she and other people who study viruses think that if you are infected with Zika today and then get pregnant in a couple of months, your baby will be fine, there is no conclusive evidence of this. From her and other experts' understanding of these kinds of viruses in general, though, they do think this is the case. But there is always a chance that a virus could break the rules. And we won't know for sure if Zika is that bad boy until we study it fully. There are some signs that Zika might not play by the rules. In July, genetic material from the Zika virus was found in the mucus of a woman's vagina who had been infected by Zika. Now, it was found there 11 days after her symptoms set in. At that point, there was no sign of the Zika virus in her blood or urine, just the genetic material of Zika in her vagina. 
which raised the possibility that Zika may stick around for longer than expected. And because this is all so new and when it comes to outbreaks of diseases, different experts, depending on their speciality, have different perspectives. We also spoke to Kathy Spong, an obstetrician and acting director of the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development. And we asked her about the CDC's recommendations to wait eight weeks after possible exposure to Zika before trying to get pregnant. If a woman has had Zika, we don't have any evidence to say that um, once that time period has passed, that she should um, have concerns for a future pregnancy. Um, then again, I would say we don't have a lot of data on it either. Are you happy with the evidence that we have on that at the moment to, to give that? This is the best information we have available. How confident are you in it? It's the best information we have available. Kathy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, the CDC has, um, these are the guidance based on the best information we have available. Depending on your perspective on life, you can take the unknowns and amplify them in your head uh, or, or you can underplay them. But when it comes to disease, we tend to overplay them. So, I mean, there's, there's always unknowns in everything we do. Um, and so I think, yes, this is an unknown that is a little more, um, a, a little heightened in the sense that this is something that is new that we don't have a lot of data on. Uh, that said, it's simply one of the many unknowns in pregnancy. After the break, Zika has been around for a very long time. So why is it spreading and causing these heartbreaking symptoms now? Welcome back. So remember when those scientists first identified Zika in Uganda in 1947 by putting the monkeys up in the tree to get bit by mosquitoes? Well, if we've known about this disease since 1947, a disease that we just heard can do some really scary things to us, especially in developing babies. Why are we just starting to notice this disease now? How did we miss it? To help us answer this question, we turn to Andrew Haddow, a researcher at the United States Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases. Now, Andrew's grandfather just happens to be Alexander Haddow, one of the first scientists to isolate Zika back in the 1940s. The first time I heard about Zika was probably when I was about three or four years old um, from my father um, during my bedtime stories. And before we talk to Andrew about why we underestimated Zika, you need to know that he has carried on his grandfather's work by making another really big discovery about Zika. A discovery made in the late 2000s in Senegal. And it all started when his buddy Kevin, who's also a scientist, was telling Andrew about this weird illness that he and his mate got when they were working with mosquitoes. I'm, I was imagining it was over beer. It was. It was, it was over a beer. It was over a beer. Um, yeah, kind of in, on a veranda looking out over a river. So I said, you know, Kevin, it sounds like you have uh, both maybe had uh, Zika virus. We need to test your blood. And then he kind of leans back in his chair and just says, well, there's something else. And I was just like, you know, what else? Because, I mean, it's just kind of like, well, what else could there be? And he's like um, – the other investigator's name was Brian Foy, and so he says, well, Brian, Brian's wife came down with the same signs and symptoms after he got back, and it's just like, what? And I mean, all of this together just kind of pointed to the likelihood of a sexual transmission event. There were some other um, signs and symptoms that pointed to the possibility. Like the, the fact um, they had sex? I'm sorry? Like the fact they had sex? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brian had noticed that there had been blood in his semen and that he had had uh, his prostate was inflamed and his wife came down with classic what we would kind of call classic uh, Zika signs and symptoms fever rash etc so this was kind of one of those things like wow I mean I said yeah we really have to get your her blood also we need to you know we need to test this and I said you know I really think that it's uh, Zika because is this is this really uncommon for this sort of um, virus? Yes. Yeah. So before this, this diagnosis, 
There were no reports, uh, to my knowledge, of sexual transmission of an arbovirus in the literature. The closest was the report of Japanese encephalitis virus in the semen of boars. So there, this is just kind of way out, uh, out there as, um, as things go. And so, you know, it was met with, I think I can, you know, say a lot of skepticism in our community. Other studies have recently confirmed what Andrew first discovered, that Zika can be found in semen, and it stays in semen longer than it does in blood. In one report, a woman got infected with Zika through unprotected sex about a month after her partner showed symptoms of Zika infection. So that means the virus was alive in her partner's semen for at least that long. As a result, the World Health Organization recommends that men who travel to Zika-infected areas wait six months before having unprotected sex. Yep, six months. Got it? Wow. Now, Andrew doesn't just probe his mate's sex life for his research. He's also been studying the genetics of the Zika virus over time. So we had a lot of questions for him. First off, though, why did this outbreak with the microcephaly and the paralysis happen now? Maybe the virus could have always done these things, but first of all, they weren't detected. So I think as we're seeing more cases, we're just getting a better understanding of really what the virus is capable of doing. It's not that it wasn't doing it in the past. It may literally just be there weren't enough people studied to really know. The other part is in these areas where Zika virus is endemic, historically, women or girls would have likely been infected at a very young age before they ever even reached puberty. And what that means is they basically would have been immune when they were adults and when they were getting pregnant and having children. And that may also be a reason why we didn't see microcephaly in, you know, in those regions before now. Honestly, I think that we owe a lot to a group of physicians in Brazil for really pushing the microcephaly you know, at the time it was a hypothesis forward and really bringing widespread um, attention to this issue. At first, um, it was, I, I'll tell you, it was met with a lot of skepticism in the, you know, scientific community. Why was there so much, so much skepticism? Well, I think what happens is we all get tunnel vision and, you know, this is what the virus does and that's all it does. And it was the same with what we know now that the case of sexual transmission, that was met with skepticism. Then you have Guillain-Barre syndrome met with skepticism and microcephaly met with skepticism. You know, we sometimes, we get so used to what we would maybe the norm that we forget that things change and that we always have to be cognizant that these viruses are in an evolutionary arms race, and they are trying to adapt to infect more hosts. So we have to be cognizant just because something hasn't done anything for, you know, 70 years doesn't mean that it, it can't do it in the future. Do you think it's possible that the Zika virus is mutating in some way to make it easier to infect big populations? So there's just a lot we don't know about the virus. We're learning new things almost every week. But what I can say is it appears that the virus is overall pretty stable. So scientists have started tracking how Zika has changed genetically since it was first detected in 1947, and they have found minor differences in its genetic code. But so far, it's still not clear if Zika is evolving to become more dangerous necessarily, or if it's basically the same old virus that just happened to find a continent of people to make sick for the very first time. Okay, so what have we learnt? First, where did Zika come from? Researchers first found it in Africa, and it's been there for probably thousands of years. Two, what happens when you get infected? There's rashes and fevers, and while there are some complications, most of the time the disease is pretty mild. In fact, 80% of people who get infected don't even show symptoms. But when you are pregnant, the virus can make a beeline for the fetus, and we're still trying to work out the full consequences of this. Third, how worried should you be if you live or are traveling to a Zika-affected part of the world? Well... 
if you're not pregnant, you're not planning on getting pregnant and you're not planning on making anyone else pregnant anytime soon, there's probably no need to be that worried. But if you are thinking of getting pregnant, this is a real concern because we currently don't know the chance that your baby will have defects if you are infected. And finally, why has this new ugly side of Zika reared its head now? We don't exactly know. One theory is that people in parts of Africa where the virus has been around for ages are now immune to it. And it was only when the virus hit a large population that has never been exposed before that trouble struck. So now that we have this problem, the big question is, of course, how to stop it. There are a few things that scientists are working on. They're seeking out a vaccine and they're also trying to lower mosquito populations, potentially by releasing genetically modified mozzies. Male mosquitoes have been specifically crafted so that when they bonk female mosquitoes, the offspring will die young. That is, the mozzie babies won't be able to make it to adulthood and won't be able to create more mozzie babies. Theory goes that if you release enough of these genetically modified dud mosquitoes, the population of mozzies will drop to hopefully the point where the diseases won't spread anymore. Small trials conducted by the company that makes these mosquitoes, Oxitec, found that releasing these guys could reduce the mozzie population by around 90%. In August, the FDA approved plans to release them into Florida, but the community over there will have to decide whether they want it or not. Thing is, even if we can get rid of 90% of the mosquitoes, there are still that cheeky 10% hanging around. Plus, the virus can spread while we are having sex. So probably the only way to protect us against Zika in the long term is to develop a vaccine. As of 2016, 29 different Zika vaccines were in development around the world. That's according to the World Health Organization. One trial started in humans back in June, another in August. But right now, scientists are just checking to see if the vaccine causes any bad side effects. That's what happens in the first batch of volunteers. Even with huge international efforts to make a good vaccine as soon as possible, the National Institutes of Health estimates that the earliest date we'll see a vaccine is in 2018. So, what can you do right now if you live in an area impacted by Zika? Scientists recommend that you try to keep mosquitoes away the best way you can. And that means getting rid of open water in containers or block drains. That's what the mozzies use to breed. Also, perhaps sleep beneath a net. You can pop on your air conditioner because mozzies don't like the cold. Also, wear long sleeves and use bug spray. Okay, that's what we know for now. The research continues, as it always does, because this is science and this was Science versus Zika. This episode has been produced by Diane Wu, Heather Rogers, Caitlin Kenny, Shruti Ravindran, and our senior producer is Caitlin Sori. Edited by Annie Rose Strasser and fact-checked by Michelle Harris. Sound design and music production by Matthew Boll, mixed by Martin Peralta and Bobby Lord. Music written by Martin Peralta and Bobby Lord. For key references, head to our webpage. Next week, we're tackling forensic science. On CSI, it looks so easy, but how much can you really trust the science that gets presented in courtrooms? I'm Wendy Zuckerman. Back to you next time. Hello, I'm Mallory Rubin. And I'm Van Lathan. Check out the Ringerverse podcast from The Ringer for all things superhero movies, nerd culture, and fandom entertainment. We have instant reviews and fun takes on all the latest news and more available now on Spotify. Hi, I'm Wendy Zuckerman, and you're listening to Gimlet Media's Science Versus. This is the show where we pit facts against fugitives. On today's show, forensic science. How much can you trust the science being presented in courtrooms? Forensic science uses scientific methods to investigate crime and prosecute people. We've all watched the telly. We know how this works. 
Hodges ran the formalin fixed tissue sample from Jane Doe 99 through GCMS. There's no traces of ecstasy, but he did find chloral hydrate. And if you need iced tea to translate for you. I hope you like hot wings. We're on the next plane to Buffalo. Forensic science has been used by law enforcement to catch and prosecute people for decades. Experts have gone into court testifying that they can match a strand of hair or a set of fingerprints to a suspect. And that testimony has been used to lock up countless bad guys. But what if they're not all bad guys? Recently, big questions have been raised about the credentials of forensic science. Questions like, is forensic science even a science? Sick burn, huh? Over the last few decades, the United States has freed more than 100 people whose convictions were partly based on forensic science evidence. And that's part of the reason why two of the most trusted science groups in the United States decided to take a critical look at forensic science. The National Academy of Sciences published their report in 2009, and the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology published their report earlier this year. Both of these reports questioned the validity of some forensic sciences and pointed out serious shortfalls in expert testimony. So, when it comes to solving crimes, there are lots of CSIs. The CSI New York, Miami, Las Vegas, Cyber... Cyber? Ugh. But then, there's science. There are a lot of areas of forensic science, from ballistics to drug testing to fiber analysis. But today, we're going to focus on the forensics that relate to the human body. These are some of the oldest forensic sciences, and they've been convincing juries of guilt or innocence for decades. First up, time of death. Using the best science available, how accurately can investigators tell when someone has died? Two, bite marks. Can you match a bite mark to a suspect's teeth? Three, fingerprints. How reliable are they? And four, hair. When a strand of hair is found at a crime scene, can you use a microscopic analysis to find out who left it there? A quick warning, today we're going to be talking about dead bodies and crime. So if you have kids with you, you might want to slip on some earbuds or save this episode for later. Let's start with time of death. One of the first things that forensic scientists are often called in to do at a crime scene is to figure out when someone died. You can check the body's temperature or how stiff it is or even do an autopsy. But if it's been more than four days, accurately predicting the time of death by just examining the body becomes a lot harder. For times like this, you need to call in a bug expert. Where is the bug man when you need him? They'll inspect the corpse for bugs that move in when the flesh has begun to rot. Sybil Bouchelai is an associate professor of entomology at Sam Houston State University in Texas. Our producer, Caitlin Sori, and I visited her in her office. Her office door is covered with inspirational posters. If you took all of the veins from your body and laid them from end to end, you would die. When work feels overwhelming, remember that you're going to die. <laughs> Pretty nice science fact. Handy poster to have. Sybil is all about bugs. She researches them, and since 2008, police have regularly called Sybil to check out the bugs at a crime scene. And she gets pretty excited about her work. Ah! I feel that all the time, though. What are we going to do now? Science! <laughs> Sybil tells us that if you want to use bugs to tell how long a person has been dead for, you've got to figure out how old the insects that are crawling on the corpse are. Flies turn up on a dead body almost immediately. They'll start eating the body and then they'll really move in. They'll fall in love, they'll start making fly babies called maggots... And when the maggots grow up, they crawl off the body, they make a little shell for themselves, like a cocoon, and then they'll escape out of their shell and fly away. For all the cases I ever do, what I'm looking for are the oldest maggot. And what that's going to tell me is how long that body has had fly activity. 
Different species will colonise the body at different times. Blowflies, for example, like a fresh corpse, and they can colonise the body really quickly. Now, in the best case scenario for Sybil, the flies will get to make and fly babies right away. They'll lay their eggs and she will catch the first generation of maggots. From here, Sybil says that she can date the corpse with remarkable accuracy. I would look at age of the maggot and then that would get you today. But like it will get you today. Wow. It can, it can. It can get you today. A paper published this year looked at the accuracy of this technique. It models how different conditions like places and seasons can affect death estimations using bugs. In the best case, the paper found that reading the bugs on a body got it right to within one day. Change the conditions, though, and the estimations could be wrong by up to 19 days. When would that process not be as like accurate as you'd like it to be? If the death occurred in the winter and the remains were placed outside, there might not be a lot of insects around. And they wouldn't colonize the cadaver until um, temperatures warmed up enough. On top of that there are always surprises. Like, here's a weird one. There's some evidence that if the victim died with cocaine in their system, the maggots would eat that up and can be found talking someone's ear off at a dance party. No, they don't do that. They don't talk. Actually, when bodies have cocaine in them, there's some evidence to suggest that the maggots will grow up faster than they usually would, and this can affect the assessment of the time of death. Plus, in some cases, flies might get to an injured person before they're even dead. Don't think about that one while you're having breakfast. Sybil is still uncovering new things about which bugs turn up and when. She and her team are constantly doing experiments researching this, and she told us about one time when her team made a two-inch cut into the belly of a corpse. They then buried the body in a shallow grave, and then... The team waited for the flies to show up. But this time, a very different bug got to the body first. Fire ants. They were taking dirt, putting it in the fluids of the wound, and then they would pick up the soggy piece of dirt and bring it back to the nest, possibly to slurp it up later. They were using the dirt as sponges, and they did this for nine days. And then on the ninth day, it rained, and it warmed up, and the body blew up like a volcano, just all the guts came out. And at that point, the fire ants lost their monopoly on, of this small incision and the flies were able to come in and lay eggs. So that's an example where the fire ants could have interfered with the, the estimation by nine days. Wow. And that if you hadn't, if someone, so if, if someone just came into that dead body and just saw the maggots there. They would think. Yeah, and they saw like, eggs and itty bitty maggots they would think that that body had been there for for maximum an hour or two given all of these variables the weather the fire ants the cocaine researchers are still working out how often they get their estimations for the time of death using bugs wrong researchers from texas a and m university wrote in a paper earlier this year that the accuracy of these estimates generally speaking are quote unknown, end quote. Sybil says that if your entire case rides on an entomologist, a bug expert, then your case is probably really bad. She says you need other types of evidence as well. Bugs are just one tool. Conclusion. Using flies to date a body has solid science behind it. We have a good idea of the life cycle of a fly and how quickly they grow once they've infested the body. But since each crime scene is different, you can't always rely on the bugs. Next up, bite marks. Bite marks have been allowed as evidence and routinely accepted in legal systems for decades. They've been used to investigate sexual assault and murder cases around the world, including in Australia, the UK, Norway and the US. Perhaps the most well-known case was of a serial killer, Ted Bundy. Two bite marks found on one of his victims were linked to Ted, and this dental evidence helped secure his conviction. But bite marks had a really unusual entry into US courts. The first ever recorded victim in a bite mark legal case wasn't a person. It was a piece of cheese. Cheese? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, 
Jeez. We heard this story from Chris Fabricant, who works at the Innocence Project. This is a group of lawyers who work to overturn convictions. They've recently been working with the FBI and Department of Justice to look into cases where faulty forensic science has been used. So, back to the cheese. Chris told us that the scene of the crime was a grocery store in a small Texas town in the 1950s. A burglar had taken a bite of a piece of cheese and some enterprising young detective had found this piece of cheese and deduced that if we could find the person who bit this cheese, we have our burglar. The sheriff suspected a local drunk of robbing the store, so he gave him another piece of cheese to bite into. The detective then made a cast of that cheese as well as the one from the store. He compared them and said, boom, they're a match. The police department brought in a dentist who agreed with the cop. What a gouda day at work. They matched those, uh, that cheese to the, the suspected burglar and we had bite mark evidence. Tasty or brie? You know, the truth is, is that's, I, you know, I don't know what kind of cheese it was. Can you breathe him? Yeah. Okay, that was back in the 1950s. Bite mark cases eventually moved from matching marks on cheese to skin, and they're still used in courts today. So here's how bite marks work today. Forget about the cheese. Say you have a body that's got what looks like bite marks. A photograph is taken of the patch of skin with the mark, and if there's a suspect, a mould is made of that person's teeth. A dentist then takes this mould and uses it to bite something, like pig skin or even a cadaver, a dead body. She then takes the photograph of this second mark, and then she puts the two photos side by side, one from the crime scene and one from the suspect's teeth. She compares how similar the bite marks are, and if they look very similar, then boom, it's a match. And your suspect did the biting. To see how this all happens in real life, we spoke to Barry Fisher, a forensic scientist who headed up the LA County Crime Lab, one of the biggest crime labs in America. By the way, crime labs are often part of police departments, and it's where cops send their evidence to be processed by forensic scientists. Barry is now retired, but he remembers when he first arrived in L.A. all those years ago. The twinkling lights on the palm trees, it was at night when I got in, were were magical, a la Disneyland. I said, boy, this is wonderful. (laughs) This is the place to be. Barry stayed in L.A. and ended up heading up the crime lab for 22 years. He's now retired. When he was head of the crime lab, he represented the squad as the president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. The thing is, even Baza has some concerns about bite mark evidence. For one, he told us that if you bite into skin, it bounces back. It can be stretched and contorted. The problem with skin is it's elastic and uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's a representation of the bite, but it's not going to uh, be an exact rep- representation. Another problem is that you can't reliably tell people's teeth apart. In 2010, a study looked at hundreds of sets of teeth and found, quote, uniqueness cannot be demonstrated, end quote. In a follow-up study using more than a thousand 3D scanned sets of teeth, it found again that teeth don't vary that widely from person to person. And there's one more thing you should know. There have been instances that have been reported where Uh, Some experts have claimed it to be a bite mark and others have said, uh, no, it's not a bite mark, it's a scratch. Yep, a scratch. Earlier this year, that report by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology wrote on the topic of bite marks that examiners, quote, cannot even consistently agree on whether an injury is a human bite mark, end quote. And so in April this year, after a six-month investigation, the Texas Forensic Science Commission unanimously recommended a moratorium on the use of bite mark analysis until the science improved. But the thing is, the President's Council report, the one we mentioned at the beginning of the show, wrote in September this year that bite mark analysis was so bad that it may not be, quote, salvageable, end quote. And... Yikes. And yet, despite the overwhelming scientific consensus that bite mark analysis is unreliable, some dentists, rebranding themselves as forensic dentists, have been going into court saying that they are certain that teeth marks found on a body 
belong to a suspect. Right now, Chris over at the Innocence Project has clients who are on death row because of cases that included bite mark evidence. Halfway through our conversation, he got a call from a colleague about a case he's working on. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're on the side of science. Mm-hmm. I guess the judge is not going to want to hear from me. All right, we'll talk, no problem. We'll talk to you soon. What was that about? It's a death penalty case in, in Pennsylvania where um, the prosecution is seeking to introduce um, bite mark comparison evidence, and um, we are seeking to challenge the admissibility of that evidence. It's not clear how often bite mark evidence is introduced into court these days. No one keeps reliable records on this. But for Chris, these cases just keep popping up. Sometimes it feels like whack-a-mole, you know what I mean? And, and um, sometimes it just feels like moles with no whacking. <laughs> it's a process, never-ending process. It's, it would be funny if there wasn't an innocent man on death row. Conclusion. Saying in court that you can definitively link a bite mark to an individual is bad science. Teeth aren't that unique, and neither are the bite marks they leave behind on stretchy skin. After the break, getting fingerprints from a bloody crime scene and a big FBI bungle. Welcome back. It's time to talk about fingerprints. Fingerprint analysis has been used for more than a century by investigators at crime scenes and prosecutors in court. And it's been used in some pretty amazing cases. Our forensic scientist Barry told us about one of his first cases involving fingerprints. It was from the 1980s. A woman was found dead in East LA. She'd been stabbed and on her stomach, something was written. Uh, Written with some creamy substance It's spelled out F-U-C, and then he ran out of room. It was pretty obvious what the perpetrator was trying to to spell out. Barry found a squeezed-out tube of moisturising cream in the woman's handbag, so his job was to try to get a fingerprint off that tube. But the tube was all crumpled up, so it was tough to get clean prints off it. It was then that he came up with a very clever plan. Barry used to carry around this handy toolbox with all sorts of gadgets, including a syringe. So he put the cap on the tube and closed it tight. Then I stuck the syringe into the bottom of the tube and I pulled out the plunger and I blew it up. It just puffed, puffed right out. It worked. The team was able to get some pretty clean prints off this very crummy tube. It, it just kind of surprised me that how such a simple, obvious thing just did the trick. Barry says the fingerprint on the tube was a match for the woman's boyfriend. And as Barry tells it, when the boyfriend was confronted with the prints, he confessed to the crime. But the question for us is how do forensic scientists know it's a match? On TV, they show fingerprints running up against a database until you hear that satisfying chirp followed by a... Russell Huntley's prints are on the Jupiters. That's not surprising. And if you need Ice-T to translate for you... First spit that lollipop out before I smack it out your mouth. But the science is just a tad more complicated. Fingerprint matching technology doesn't match up an entire fingerprint swirl for swirl. Instead, they match up certain features on the fingerprint, like the point where the ridges end or split off. And there's no consensus on how many features need to be the same to call two fingerprints a match. Some countries say you need at least 12 points, some say 7 or 16. Still other countries, like the US, don't have any minimum number at all. This is ultimately because experts don't actually know how unique any of these points on a fingerprint are. Large population studies on the uniqueness of various features on fingerprints haven't been done. Plus, on the TV, these points of similarity are all matched on computers. But like most dreams of technology, where's my jetpack? The technology just isn't that good. 
At the FBI, one of the best forensic crime labs in the world, there is a database of millions of fingerprints, but it only gets you so far. Here's Barry. Well, we, we haven't gotten to the point where we're relying on computers to say it's an identification. You have What we're still using is a, uh, a human being to have a look at this stuff. So a computer will throw up potential matches. The FBI told us it's typically three. And then it's up to humans to narrow down those matches to an individual. And as Stalin once said, once you've got people, you've got problems. Well, sounds like something he would say. Which brings us to this guy. My name is uh, Dr. E.T.L. And you pronounce E.T.L. like the letter E.T.L. You know the movie E.T.? So it's an L. E.T.L. Yes. Yeah. And you can say it a bit faster if you practice it a lot and say <laughs> E.T.L. Thank you. Dr. E.T.L. Draw at the University College London researches cognitive bias in experts. Or as he puts it... When smart people do stupid things, when do competent experts make mistakes, not because they're not motivated or drunk or whatever. So ETL says that all humans, dumb, smart, drunk, sober, have biases. And this can become a problem when analysing fingerprints. When it's not easy call, it's not clearly a match or not a match, then there's more interpretation Subjectivity is involved. It's not totally objective. It's not CSI Hollywood. Now, these issues with fingerprints weren't really considered to be a problem until this happened. There's been a devastating terrorist attack in Spain. Without warning, a coordinated series of rush hour explosions struck three train stations in Madrid. In March 2004, bombs were detonated on several trains in Madrid, killing around 200 people and leaving more than 1,800 injured. Spanish authorities recovered fingerprints on a bag of detonators and then sent them to the FBI laboratory to help get the culprit. Because, as we mentioned before, the FBI has one of the best forensic laboratories in the world. The FBI ran their prints through their database of millions of fingerprints and it suggested 20 candidates. It was then, as usual, up to the FBI examiner to compare the prints found on the bag to potential matches. One of those 20 potentials was an attorney based in Portland, Oregon, called Brandon Mayfield. The fingerprint examiner claimed there were 15 distinct points on Brandon's fingerprint that matched the ones on the detonator bag. And so the examiner said it was a match. The prints were then sent to three other experts and all four of them agreed that the print on the detonator matched Brandon's. Meanwhile, the FBI got busy rifling through Brandon's records and surveilling him. They found out that Brandon was Muslim and he defended a convicted terrorist in a child custody case. Soon, Brandon was arrested. But then, around two weeks later, the Spanish authorities said they had found another match for this print. A man who, unlike Brandon, was actually in Spain at the time of the bombing. The FBI admitted they screwed up. They offered him $2 million and apologised. Here's Brandon speaking after the fact. I I honestly felt like I was being framed because I, I hadn't been out of the country for over 10 years. And a year and a half later, the Department of Justice put out a report trying to figure out what went wrong. Their report highlighted a couple of things. First, they pointed out that the prints, Brandon's and the ones found on the bag, had an unusual similarity. That is, they really did have a bunch of matching points. But the FBI also acknowledged that there were some problems in their process. Like at one point in the investigation, this was after the initial match, the fingerprint examiners knew that Brandon had acted as an attorney for a convicted terrorist and that he was Muslim. The Department of Justice noted that one of the fingerprint examiners admitted that if the person who had been identified had been a different kind of person, quote, like the Maytag repairman, end quote, the lab might have caught the error. Okay, so Brandon's prints apparently did look a lot like the prints on the detonator bag. But the Department of Justice report noted that examiners began to find more features in the fingerprints that looked similar, which quote, were not really there, end quote. 
What seemed to be happening was the examiners were focusing on similarities with the fingerprints and they were explaining away the little differences they saw. And then when other examiners saw the prints, they might have been influenced by what their colleagues thought they saw. ETL has a phrase for when this kind of thing happens, the snowball bias effect. The bias is more and more elements and more and more people involved. The bias gets very, very big like a snowball. That's why I call it the bias snowball effect. And everybody is happy we send the guilty person to jail. So ETL watched as the FBI fumbled the Madrid bombing case and he couldn't stop thinking about context and bias. So he ran a little experiment of his own. He gave five fingerprint examiners two sets of fingerprints. One, he said, was Brandon Mayfield, the American accused of the Madrid bombing. And the other, he said, were the prints found on the detonator bag. Now, the experts knew that this was a high-profile case that had been bungled. So, perhaps unsurprisingly, four out of five of these experts said that the prints did not match. But the thing is, ETL had tricked them. He didn't give them Brandon's fingerprints and the prints on the detonator bag. He actually gave each examiner a set of prints from a totally different case, an earlier case that each examiner had worked on and had once said were a match. This meant that thinking they knew the context of a case actually caused four out of five examiners to change their minds about whether two sets of prints were a match. Now, ETL's study was very small, only five examiners, but it was one of the first to look at how bias and context can affect fingerprint analysis. Since then, other work has also demonstrated that fingerprint examiners can change their analysis depending on different circumstances. Now, it's important to note, though, that these later studies suggest that the impact of subjectivity is not as dramatic as what ETL found, with four out of five people changing their minds. An FBI study estimates that examiners get it wrong one in every 306 cases. Now, how you feel about that error rate probably depends on where you sit in the courtroom. But ETL doesn't want us to give up on fingerprints, even though he studies the problems around them. He remains a big fan. Fingerprinting is one of the best forensic science evidence. Conclusion. Fingerprint analysis isn't perfect. It's complicated and there is human judgment involved. But still, it is a pretty good way to identify someone. The problem is that it's not as infallible as many people and jurors think. Final stop. Hair analysis. On TV shows, investigators are always combing through the crime scene, searching for that one telltale strand of hair. Take a look at this hair. I happen to catch a glimpse of this blonde hair and the zipper here. Hair. Detectives want to find a hair so they can match it to a potential suspect. Here's how it works. A hair turns up at a crime scene. Examiners look at it under the microscope and then they see if it's similar to someone else's hair, like a suspect's. The idea is that there are teeny tiny differences within hair that are unique to each person. And we're not just splitting hairs here. This has been used in cases where people have been put on death row. For decades, the FBI went oh, around the country on. training hundreds of experts on how to compare hair samples. Here's an FBI training video from the 1960s. From a microscopic examination of hairs, we can determine race, body area... Hairs recovered from the victim's garment can be compared with hairs from a suspect. The people trained by the FBI then used that expertise in hundreds of cases, helping to put some people on death row. But what can looking at hair under a microscope really tell you about a suspect? Patrick Bazzini is an associate professor of forensic science at Sam Houston State University. He told us that there was good science to tell the difference between whether a hair comes from a human, a cat or a dog. And Patrick says this is pretty obvious under a microscope. Oh, definitely, uh, yes. I think that the microscope is really the best instrument to make this type of determination is a must. OK, so there's good science to show this is a human hair. Where do we start getting into the bad science? What do you mean the bad science? I think you know what I mean. Yes, I was just teasing you, of course. In 2002, a landmark study found that in 9 out of 80 cases where hair examiners had said that two hairs look the same under the microscope, they actually came from different people. So that means 71 out of 80 were right. 
That's not bad if you're doing a test and you're in primary school, but maybe not so good if you're sitting in a courtroom and your life depends on it. Is it possible to take a hair sample from a crime scene and say, Wendy, this is your hair? Absolutely not. Not at least uh, if uh, there is the possibility that another unknown individual may have originated that hair. And while there might be teeny, seemingly special microscopic features in my hair, there are no good big studies showing how unique those features really are, which means that experts cannot say with any level of confidence that a certain hair came from a particular person. And the Department of Justice agrees. They acknowledge that you can't match a person to a particular strand of hair based on microscopic evidence. The problem is that throughout the 1990s, courtroom experts were oh, claiming that they room. could match a hair sample to a person. But today, the FBI is acknowledging the problems with hair. In June of this year, the director of the FBI wrote a letter admitting that there were problems with how their examiners were talking about hair comparisons in court. He said... Quote, in many cases, we have discovered that the examiners made statements that went beyond the limits of science in ways that put more weight on hair comparison than scientifically appropriate. End quote. Chris Fabricant from The Innocence Project says... My favorite example is actually a favorite example from uh, Texas. The hair examiner in that case had said that the chances that uh, somebody apart from the defendant had left the hair at the crime scene were slim to none, and none just left town. <laughs> As in, the hair examiner said that there is no chance I'm wrong, I know this hair belongs to the suspect. The FBI is now working with the Innocence Project to review more than 3,000 criminal cases that used microscopic hair analysis. As of March last year, the FBI announced that in 268 cases where the FBI testimony was used against a defendant at trial, in 96% of cases, wrong statements were made about hair analysis. 96%. In 33 of those cases people were sentenced with the death penalty. Nine of those were executed. Five died of other causes while on death row. Conclusion. There's no good scientific evidence that you can match a strand of hair to an individual by looking at that hair under the microscope. So when it comes to forensic science, does it stack up? How accurately can scientists use bugs to tell when someone died? Well, under ideal conditions, they can nail the time of death to the day. But when things are unexpected, like fire ants or cocaine, the science can get messy. Bite marks. Can you match a bite mark to a suspect's set of teeth? No. Teeth haven't been shown to be that unique, and the bite marks that they make are even less unique. Fingerprints, how reliable are they? Most of the time, fingerprint examiners get it right, but they're not perfect and human judgment is involved. And hair, can you pin a suspect based on a microscopic analysis of their hair? Nope. Science is not good enough to see hair under a microscope and match it to a particular person. But hair is very useful in other ways. There's a gold mine of information in the DNA of hair, and that can pin a suspect to a crime. DNA has in fact become the gold standard of forensic science, and there's good science behind it with clear statistical certainty. DNA has been used to put guilty people away and set innocent people free. But forensic scientists have now started pushing the boundaries of what DNA evidence can do. They're able to extract tiny amounts of genetic evidence from doorknobs, coffee mugs, and even weapons in a way that just wasn't possible decades ago. A new generation of forensic science is upon us. But is it any better than the old stuff? That's coming up next time on Science Versus. We'll be back with part two of Science Versus Forensic Science in two weeks. And when we do, we're getting our hands really dirty. So has, is this person wearing a shirt? No, that is what the flesh ends up looking like throughout the decomposition process. It looks like they're wearing clothes, but it's actually skin. 
This episode has been produced by Shruti Ravindran, Diane Wu, Austin Mitchell, Heather Rogers and Caitlin Kenny. Our senior producer is Caitlin Sori. Edited by Annie Rose Strasser. Back checking by Michelle Harris. Sound design and music production is by Matthew Boll. This has been mixed by Martin Peralta and Bobby Lord. Music written by Bobby Lord. I'm Wendy Zuckerman. Back to you next time. Hi, I'm Wendy Zuckerman, and you're listening to Gimlet Media's Science Versus. This is the show where we pit facts against law and order. Do, 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 do. Quick warning, we're going to get our hands on some dead bodies in this episode. So if you have some small ears listening or some big ears on a small person, maybe you want to hold off listening to this episode right now or switch to headphones. This is part two of our episode on forensic science. In part one, we looked at areas of forensic science that have been used for decades. These include bite marks, fingerprints and microscopic hair analysis. So if you haven't heard that one, we recommend that you go back and have a listen. Now, in this episode, we're looking at forensic science that has just started entering the courtroom and putting people behind bars. Forensic science that is pushing the boundaries of what's technologically possible. To explore these new emerging sciences, we're going to dive into two high-profile cases that you might have heard of. First, we'll look at the Amanda Knox trial to explore the emerging problems with DNA evidence. And then we'll look at the Casey Anthony trial to investigate cutting-edge science into the smell of death. Yep, you heard me right. The smell of death. When it comes to who done it, everyone has an opinion, but then there's science. My producer Caitlin Sori and I headed to Texas to meet some researchers that are working at the forefront of forensic science. Welcome to Texas. We're in Huntsville, about an hour's drive north of Houston, and dotted in the fields surrounding us are cows as well as seven prisons, including one that houses inmates on death row. We're driving a little bit away from the main town, heading to a research facility run by Sam Houston State University. It's called a body farm, and it's where donated dead bodies are carefully laid on the ground outside so that scientists can watch as the corpses break down. Caitlin was a little nervous. It's like we've just driven into a horror film. Come on! No, but it is. Like, look at all these, like, cute little houses. There's mist in the air, and we're on a road towards a body farm. It's a bit creepy. You are absolutely reading into this. This is just a small town. We're driving to our deaths. Dead end. <laughs> we are literally seeing a sign that says dead end. You might want to slow down there. Yeah, over to the stop sign. The researchers at the body farm study the corpse's smell, skin, hair, nails and bones. Their findings are then used to help figure out what cops can tell from dead bodies at a crime scene. So what can we uh, do for you? The head of this research facility is Dr Joan By the Way. And we met her in a room full of bones, carefully put away in little drawers. Doesn't it smell good? What does that smell? Just the, from, from the bones and, um, yeah, that's, that's what it smells like. It's a wonderful space in here. Joan wore bright pink scrubs. Her glasses chains were sparkling with little beads. Joan was training to become a hairdresser before she completely switched gears, eventually doing a PhD in anthropology and ending up here. Joan took us on a tour of where the bodies are being left to rot. Haley Dodd and Kevin Durr, who work with her, came along for the ride. Uh, my rule that I always have when I come out here is I always bring gloves, always, because you never know, you never know. This facility is surrounded by a high metal fence with razor wire running along the top, kind of like how you see at prisons. The vultures have heard us approaching and cleared off for the moment. Through the gate is a forest of tall trees and some shrubs. Caitlin and I are playing it cool until we spot our first corpse. So is, is this person wearing a shirt? No, that is what the flesh ends up looking like throughout the decomposition process. It looks like they're wearing clothes, but it's actually skin. It's desiccated skin, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's lost all of its moisture and it's a Incredibly tough when it's in that state. Incredibly tough. And it, that, that skin can last like that for years. We've counted it 
out here. Most of the bodies we're looking at today have been decomposing for at least a couple of months. They are stretched out like starfish. Joan tells us that you could find a lot of evidence on a body like this if it was at a crime scene, including, say, the DNA of a perpetrator. Let's say that this individual had physically tried to defend herself or and she had DNA under her nails. You know, you could potentially, because the nails are very resilient, I mean, they, they will stay on uh, the hands and feet, and you could potentially use that to collect DNA. But when you scrape under the fingernails of a victim looking for a perpetrator's DNA, it tends to be only a small amount of DNA to work with. Over the last decade or so, scientists have become much better at analysing that small amount of DNA, which, by the way, is called trace DNA. And it can be found in the handful of cells that you shed when you sweat, cough, or even just touch a doorknob. And trace DNA is the first type of forensic science that we're diving into today. We're asking, how reliable is the evidence that we get from trace DNA? To explore this, let me tell you about what happened on November 2007 in a small, picturesque Italian town. A British student, Meredith Kircher, was found stabbed to death in her house. The alleged murder weapon was found in the kitchen of a young man called Raphael Solicito. Raphael was dating one of Meredith's housemates, Amanda Knox. An Italian investigative team said that trace DNA on the blade of the knife matched the victim, Meredith. And they said that DNA on the handle of the knife matched Amanda. These DNA traces painted quite the picture in people's minds. Amanda Knox holding a knife and plunging it into her housemate. A bloodied bra clasp was also uncovered. It was Meredith's. And the investigators said it had Raphael's DNA on it. With these key pieces of evidence, the Italian police charged Amanda Knox and Raphael Solicito with Meredith's murder. The story had the hallmarks of a juicy one. Hot international students, young love and murder. And the media lapped it up. American student Amanda Knox is found guilty of killing a fellow student during a drug-fueled sex game that went horribly wrong. The girl known as Foxy Noxy is why Italians are calling this the trial of the decade. Amanda and Raphael were found guilty of murder. But then, after spending four years in prison, Amanda Knox and All Raphael right. Celestito I gotta go for now. Uh, let's see. Probably based on problems with the DNA evidence. I'll probably be Just back tomorrow. I'm not sure yet. Court annulled the see everyone next time. So, what went wrong with the DNA evidence? <laughs>